Muy buenos días. Por favor, vayan tomando asiento. Good morning, everybody. Let's start. Welcome, welcome all of you to the Elcano Royal Institute. It is my great pleasure to open such a timely event entitled Innovation and Connectivity, Key Drivers in EU-Japan Cooperation. As you know, the entry of force of the EU-Japan Economic and Strategic Partnership last year has paved the way for enhanced cooperation on different, different issues. A cooperation that is particularly welcome uh, as the actual multilateral and rules-based international order faces presently numerous challenges, including the questioning even of its normative foundations. Today we are going to tackle a couple of those issues embodying growing EU-Japan cooperation, digital economy and connectivity. Two topics that uh, are quite significant for determining the international role that the European Union and Japan will play in the near, the near future. On the one side, their performance in the digital economy and the new wave of industrial revolution will determine whether we can keep our privileged position in the global value chains and hence the high living standards of our population and our soft and normative power. Either we are leaders in the digital economy or other countries will impose their standards to regulate the economy <clears throat> of tomorrow. And probably those standards may not be as conductive to an effective protection of human rights as we would like to. Therefore, we will explore today how the EU and Japan can have a more effective cooperation in this field. On the other side, connectivity has become a catchword in international relations as more and more countries consider necessary to improve their connectivity in order to accelerate their <coughs> socio-economic development. This situation is being recognized by different powers that have launched their own connectivity initiatives to favor their economic and their strategic interests. China, of course, has been particularly proactive through its Belt and Road Initiative, which raised huge expectations throughout the world, although so far it has had a mixed record when it comes to fostering development in the participating countries. The EU, the EU and Japan signed a partnership on sustainable connectivity and quality infrastructure on the 27th of September of last year that provides an alternative model of connectivity governance through a paradigm <coughs> of infrastructure development based on sustainability and level playing field. We will today discuss how those different connectivity models will interact and the implications for Japan, the EU, and the involved countries, among them, obviously, Spain. I would like to stress this last point because the bilateral cooperation between the EU and Japan of the digital economy and connectivity has major, major repercussions for other countries. I do not want to finish this very, very short, brief, welcoming remarks before thanking the Embassy of Japan, thank you, Ambassador, for supporting our efforts to better understand Japan's foreign policy, and to all the speakers that will participate in the next uh, two sessions. In particular, I would like to stress my gratitude to those who are coming from very, very, very far away to share with us their insights in EU-Japan relations. And indeed, to all of you for your attention and for finding time to participate <coughs> in this event. Now let me welcome the Ambassador of Japan in Spain, Mr. Kenji Hiramatsu. Mr. Hiramatsu, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much again. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lamo de Espinosa, for your kind words. I'm very pleased to be here uh, together with you to talk about a very important topic of uh, EU-Japan relationship focusing on innovation and pro promoting quality infrastructure. So those two issues are really key agenda for Japan-EU relationship. Since I arrived here last uh, November, I feel a lot of potential for mutual cooperation between Japan and EU, especially Japan and Spain, on these two issues. I'm very happy to have uh, two, three very important uh, professors uh, and eminent person coming to join us 
in this important event. Uh, Mr. Ken Endo is a famous uh, professor uh, dealing with uh, EU-Japan, Europe-Japan relationship for many years. He's very prominent professor of Hokkaido University. And Mr. Uh, Yokozawa Makoto, a uh, professor of Kyoto University. This is actually my university. I graduated. Thank you for coming to join us. It is issue of uh, innovation is one of the topics we are tackling with today. So uh, I'm pleased to have a presence of Mr. Yokozawa in this uh, seminar. And lastly, but most importantly for me is, uh, where is, where is she? Oh, she, uh, she's uh, Abe Reiko. Uh, she has been working for many years, especially in the infrastructure area in India. I was ambassador uh, in India for four years. I worked with her many years. And uh, she's very, played a very active role uh, in constructing famous India's uh, uh, metro or subways. And uh, she's uh, uh, named as uh, Madame Metro or Mother Metro. <laughs> so uh, she's a very well-known person in India. Maybe you may imagine that how difficult it is to work as a woman to, uh, uh, to have a uh, uh, kind of a uh, work uh, together with uh, Indian workers to construct, a, to construct metro. But uh, he, she made a tremendous achievement in uh, constructing a metro in Delhi and other cities in a very timely manner, uh, introducing Japanese way of uh, construction, engineering. Maybe she will explain in detail about her experience, but it's a real opportunity for you. Uh, Japanese women had uh, such a kind of achievement in construction engineer field uh, in India. So I'm very pleased to see my good friend uh, Reiko-san uh, here uh, in, this, in this symposium. As uh, uh, Mr. Ramo Espinosa pointed out rightly, uh, Japan and uh, uh, EU enjoy very good relationship in many ways. But today's topic of uh, innovation and connectivity are two areas that Japan is focusing on in their relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the EU. So I think topics have been well chosen and uh, it's very timely agenda to discuss today in detail. Uh, Mana, I have been involved in this business, especially innovation and connectivity for many years, especially as ambassador in India. Connectivity is very important for Japan in that area, especially we are advocating the importance of the concept of uh, free and open in the Pacific, which means uh, connectivity plays a very substantial role, how to connect well uh, in this region of the Pacific. In the Pacific means uh, not only in these uh, two oceans, but also to connect Africa to the western part of the uh, uh, American continent. So this is a very wide range of area, but we are talking about how to connect well and uh, how to instruct, construct uh, good infrastructure in this area. So the uh, concept of a quality inf infrastructure is very important for us. Uh, that means uh, infrastructure should be uh, sustainable. Uh, we have to take into account the importance of life cycle cost and uh, also environmental concern and how to make infrastructure resilient to natural disaster like an uh, earthquake. So Japanese uh, industry has a lot of uh, experience in dealing with uh, this kind of uh, uh, quality infrastructure. So we are advocating uh, many countries in the region that we should construct uh, quality infrastructure. We are making some success story in some countries in this area. Of course, uh, Abe-san will uh, tell us about our experience in dealing with this issue. But we are very pleased and we are eager to construct more quality infrastructure in this region. And also, this is part of, as I said, uh, important concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific concept uh, that was advocated by Prime Minister Abe. It was initiated, I think, in 2016 when Mr. Abe participated uh, in TICAT meeting, Tokyo International Conference on African Development in Kenya. He told the importance of a concept of a free and open in the Pacific. It's not only infrastructure, but we have a more <coughs> wide-ranging philosophy 
of a democracy, open market, and also uh, very resilient um, infrastructure in the region. So this idea has been getting more support uh, in this region. The uh, United States has joined uh, in this concept. Prime President Trump has set almost the same concept, uh, which is called uh, free and open in the Pacific. And also countries like India, Australia are supporting this concept. And uh, also ASEAN countries have come, out to come up with uh, its own idea of free and open uh, Indo-Pacific idea. That is very similar to our vision. So uh, this idea is now getting more uh, resonance in the region. And also this concept of uh, uh, quality infrastructure, infrastructure is getting more support. So we are very happy that uh, this is now happening in the region. But most happily enough, uh, the European Union uh, is joining this concept, especially how to uh, construct uh, uh, quality infrastructure overall. I have been talking with uh, many uh, government officials uh, in Spain. They are very keen to uh, work with uh, Japan to uh, establish more uh, better connectivity uh, globally, uh, not only uh, in the Pacific region, but also to include uh, some of the African countries. I'm talking how we can materialize the idea of a resilient infrastructure, uh, for example, in Africa. I'm sure that other European countries have interest in working with Japan uh, in having more better infrastructure uh, in that region, especially uh, based on the idea of, of uh, quality infrastructure. So I'm very keen to work with uh, European countries uh, to have a more concrete project and uh, uh, this uh, concept. So I'm sure that uh, in the second session of quality infrastructure, uh, we will have, we have a lot of discussion how to materialize this idea in concrete terms, especially, for example, in African continent. And um, with regard to uh, uh, Society 5.0, this is idea initiated by Japan, and also we are now advocating the importance of a data-free flow with trust. Uh, this idea was also announced by Prime Minister Abe, uh, I think it was last year in Davos Symposium, and it was almost endorsed by all member countries of G20 when G20 summit meeting was uh, held in Osaka uh, last uh, July. So uh, this idea uh, is uh, a little bit difficult uh, balance between the you know, free flow of uh, data, but also how to ensure data protection and some aspect of uh, national security. Of course, 5G is one of the areas we are now discussing quite a lot. We are watching what kind of decision countries like uh, India or European Union will take with regard to 5G. Uh, this is very important juncture for having a new technology and uh, getting taking into account various aspects uh, to make sure that uh, these aspects are be uh, taken, uh, taken into account. So uh, we are happy, I'm happy again, that uh, this issue of our innovation will be taken up in this, in this discussion too. So uh, I personally very much encourage that Elkano uh, Institute have taken up uh, this agenda as an important uh, pillars of a bilateral relationship between Japan and the EU, especially uh, Japan and EU relationship. As ambassador, I work hard in order that a concrete project will be implemented under uh, these uh, pillars. And uh, I'm sure that uh, countries uh, in Europe are very much keen to work with us uh, in view of the difficult uh, relationship between China and the U.S. Is, uh, will continue to be uh, problematic in years to come. I'm sure that the relationship between Japan and the EU will be much more important and we have to work very hard that uh, rule-based uh, order will be preserved uh, in the future. We put great importance to the rule of law. I think European countries will share the same value. So uh, to EU and Japan really share the same values. Uh, we are real partners, so uh, we have to work together in order that the years, um, decades to come, will be uh, good for international community. 
So uh, this is, I think, beginning of a series uh, of the discussion uh, in, in Elgano. But I'm happy as ambassador to be part of this discussion. Again, I'm, thank you very much for everybody to join us. And especially my special thanks go to three speakers from Japan who came all the way from Japan and also from India. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I must, I must warn the Spanish speakers that the Ambassador speaks Spanish perfectly. <laughs> Learned in Salamanca uh, years ago. No? Uh, today he spoke in, in English. Uh, and listening to you, Ambassador, I, I thought that we should organize in the near future a meeting of the Indo-Pacific region. We talked a lot about that because it's becoming a very, very hot uh, where the interests of uh, China, India, the US, Japan, East African countries overlap and, and frequently <coughs> clash. No? So we have to think, Ma Mario, <laughs> we have to think in organizing, <laughs> in organizing a meeting on the geopolitical dimension of the Indo-Pacific region. And now let me move to our keynote speaker, Professor Ken Endo. Dr. Endo is Professor of International <coughs> Politics at the Hokkaido University and a young fellow at the Japanese Institute of International Studies. He is, as the ambassador said before, the most renowned Gen Japanese expert on EU-Japan relations. And it's a great honor, Professor Endo, to have you here today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Is it on? Yeah, I think so. Uh, buenos, buenos dias. Uh, good morning. Um, I uh, am tremendously honored uh, to be able to be here and uh, invited to this beloved country of Spain and also lovely Institute of Elcano. My sincere gratitude goes to Chairman Lamo de Espinoza uh, and uh, I don't know if he's here, Director Charles Powell? No, Dr. Uh, Mark uh, 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 Esteban and also uh, Moha of Japan, especially Ambassador Hiramatsu. Now, I'm, uh, um, this is the second time, in fact, to be invited for a speech in this country, and then I met some of the old friends, and then I'm so happy to be back. Now, um, again, I'm so happy to be able to share the, some of the uh, thoughts uh, on the, uh, uh, the theme of today, innovation and the connectivity, key drivers of EU-Japan cooperation. Uh, I regard this topic highly uh, topical, um, given the ongoing debates on Belt and Road, uh, FOIP, the free and open in the Pacific Oceans, uh, uh, you know, the uh, initiatives, uh, as mentioned already, 5G networks, and particularly US Japan, uh, sorry, US China rivalries. Uh, with which uh, some have said the, uh, the silicon curtain uh, instead of iron curtain has descended. Now, I think we must seize this opportunity to think through what, should, what sort of uh, problematic we are facing and, 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 and with regard to that, the what should be done in which ways. Uh, I think the, uh, it's not far-fetched to, to say that the Europe and Japan are well positioned to uh, sort of help stopping the world uh, drifting uh, further more. Now, uh, for today's uh, speech, uh, let me start from a brief historical review of uh, what sort of cooperative relations uh, the Europe and Japan have made uh, and then move to identify and then structure the contemporary problematic um, uh, faced by Europe and Japan, revolving around this uh, connectivity and innovation, uh, data economy and so on, uh, and finally suggesting a way forward. Now, uh, the speakers uh, 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 in the afternoon, no, sorry, after this session, uh, speak more about the concrete issues uh, and, and the uh, topics uh, in uh, various parts of the world uh, about infrastructure and digital economy. So I would like to uh, focus more on the meanings of this problematic of uh, uh, connectivity and the uh, uh, data economy, uh, especially in relation to the Japan relations. 
Now, let me start from the historical uh, uh, overview. Now, um, sorry, I just uh, made a very small, uh, simple, uh, oh. um, by the way, I have done some work on Mr. Jacques Delors for my doctoral research. Maybe you can find his face. And I have done some research on the history of European integration, and recently more about the uh, crisis of Europe. Now, some work about the EU's regulatory power, global governance, and so on. And more recently, I have done also, I, I commissioned the, something like 100 articles about Japan security, um, over the, uh, which, was, which are collected, uh, recollected in eight volumes uh, published by one publisher. Now, more recently, I have been absorbed by this saga uh, of Brexit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was asked to write something about the UK and Japan and also the perceptions of the EU after the Brexit and so on. So let me move on. Now, um, as you might know uh, well, the, um, uh, historically speaking, the EU-Japan relations were nothing but significant, uh, you know, rather boring over the many, many years. Well, imagine a few decades ago, uh, a conference like this in Madrid, uh, you know, about EU-Japan. I'm just wondering, the eyes of the international-minded uh, people of a democratized Spain uh, must have been fixed more or less on Europe, Brussels and Paris, and if not, onto the areas of Mediterranean oceans, regions, and Americas, north and south, pro probably. Well, if Japan ever attracted attention, it would have been over the trade dispute, uh, especially in the 70s and 80s. Well, one of the lowest points came uh, in, in the early 1980s, uh, before you're joining the then European community, when Japan-produced videotape recorders were stockpiled in a French town called Poitiers. Now, mistrust lingered uh, for a long, long time. In fact, Japan was long viewed as, the, at best, the uh, you know, vital com rival competitor, or at worst, an economic exploitator for a long time. Now, turning point came in 1991, when EC and Japan uh, hold a summit in The Hague uh, and made a joint declaration. Document followed the example of uh, the EC-US declaration in the previous year, uh, signaling the emergence of Europe as an international actor in the post-Cold War uh, period. Thereby, uh, and this document uh, institutionalized an annual summit between the EU and Japan. <clears throat> and it was in this document that Japan was for the first time explicitly recognized as partner. I have heard from a diplomat who, who led the making of this declaration <clears throat> that it helped afterward to smoothen the bilateral relations, this uh, recognition as partner. That was in 1991. But politically speaking, um, uh, a sort of limbo followed suit. The, while the action program uh, was established in 2001, it didn't bring about anything really significant or concrete. But in the meantime, uh, economic, uh, in the economic terrain, the EU-Japan relations has gradually grown up. Grown up. Uh, in uh, 2017, the EU was Japan's fourth largest trading partner in goods, while Japan was the sixth largest uh, destination market for EU exports and goods, and the fifth largest market for EU agricultural foods uh, exports. Well, I can continue about this uh, trade stuff, uh, and then, but, uh, but uh, I just skip. And then um, it is based on this deepening of economic relations that the EU and Japan embarked on a new stage of bilateral relations. 
And here, of course, I'm referring to the historic event of signing two documents, uh, EPA and SPA, Economic Partnership Agreement and Strategic Partnership Agreement in July 2018. Uh, both of them are now operative. In the background uh, of these two documents, a few factors prove decisive in my view, and especially political disturbances in the United States uh, was a, a, a big factor. But initially, for instance, uh, the, uh, Japan was concerned about the EU-Korean FTA, uh, which would dent, uh, which would have, uh, which dented, in fact, the competitiveness of Japanese industry. But yet it came to conclude the five years negotiations of this EPA and SPA. The election of Mr. Trump as US president in, back in 2016 and subsequent, sub, <coughs> subsequent withdrawal from a Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement certainly upset the calculus uh, of Tokyo. Now, Japanese government acted swiftly to secure the TPP-11 agreement and went on to complete the EPA and SPA with Europe. I think it was seen as a sort of joint venture to save the free trade. Now, <coughs> secondly, the um, EPA and the SPA uh, and related documents uh, never failed to mention the shared values between Europe and Japan, uh, democracy, freedom, rule of law, human rights, and so on. This is no coincidence. As the ambassador has already mentioned, uh, we share these sort of universal values with the decay in advanced democracies in the United States, United Kingdom, and rise and resilience of authoritarian regimes such as China and Russia, we are uh, real partners uh, upholding those universal values in the world, unfortunately. Most of the countries in Europe and Japan are also so socially matured economies and markets as compared to the emergent and developing countries. Hence, the values like quality of life, high standards, um, uh, well, indeed, the quality infrastructure are also shared. We simply do not want to have cheap and lesser quality goods and services uh, flood in. Now, uh, so, you know, it's already imperative for Europe and Japan to cooperate. And do we need to talk about connectivity and data economy still? the theme of today's conference. <coughs> Here, um, um, first of all, the, those, who, uh, uh, those who are not so familiar with the uh, connect, uh, you know, how and why these issues of connectivity and data economy came in, <laughs> I, I just introduce the uh, simple uh, 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 fact uh, that uh, you know the, uh, uh, already the ambassador uh, refers to. The last September, the President Juncker of the European Commission and Prime Minister Abe of Japan signed a document, the Partnership on Sustainable Connectivity and Quality inf Infrastructure between Japan and the European Union. And here it declares Japan and the EU affirm their commitments, uh, commitment to establishing a connectivity partnership based on sustainability as a shared value, quality infrastructure, and their belief in the benefits of a level playing field, and intend to work together on, on all dimensions of connectivity, bilaterally, multilaterally, including digital, transport, energy, people-to-people -people exchanges. The same document emphasized the development of a digital economy depends on an open, free, stable, accessible, interoperative, reliable, and secure cyberspace and on free, uh, sorry, data free flow with trust, uh, DFFT, right? 
uh, data free flow with trust. Now, um, a data economy is, 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 is considered as a, a part of the global digital ecosystem. Now, we gather today, uh, at least partly, to discuss the you know, sustainable uh, infrastructure and data digital economy as a result of this declaration. Now, but uh, um, more anal analytically speaking, I think we cannot just stop at pointing out this document that we, you know, why we are discussing this theme. Uh, here, um, uh, you know, uh, already uh, excellent papers are produced by Anna and uh, Marco uh, about this connectivity and data economy. Uh, and uh, having read that, there aren't so much to add uh, except that, uh, you know, perhaps I could situate this theme in the more like political theoretical uh, exercises. And I would like to uh, 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 put the, uh, the theme uh, in the context of um, uh, hegemony building, uh, uh, the shifting global hegemony. Uh, now, um, I think uh, these two, um, uh, you know, the uh, connectivity and data economy uh, add up the necessity of a reinforced cooperation between Europe and Japan. And just let me um, elaborate the logic behind uh, uh, taking a few minutes. Now, I would regard that the uh, hegemony is consisted of three elements, military capability and control of global socioeconomic fabrics um, across the globe, and third, the indicative power to persuade others of some righteousness. Now, if we look back at history, the Great Britain in its height in the 19th century, possessed more tons of major battleships than France, Germany, Russia, and the United States all combined. It had P and O, uh, a type of maritime global networks. In fact, it was reaching to my region, Hokkaido, in the northern part of Japan. It also had the Reuters, Lloyds, and later in the, in the early 20th century BBC, too, a sort of information and risk assessment giant based on the undersea cables and radio networks. The UK also was a gl global hub of immigrants, uh, having banking uh, and financial networks all over the world but centered around the city. These form the economic and social basis of the UK hegemony, giving it some control over the flow of information and capital and people. It's a sort of, uh, you know, the grip of the distribution switchboard. Now, 20th, 20th century hegemon is, of course, the United States. And it still remains one of the, uh, the most powerful power in the world. The United States uh, had, and still have, the naval and air powers uh, instead of naval powers of the United Kingdom. But it had the air powers also of a global reach and later space too. It also had New York Times, Wall Street Journal, based on the immigrants into New York and capital from all over the world. It also had worldwide television networks, banking and financial industries at the Wall Street, and the internet, sort of another sort of uh, a distribution switchboard. Plus, uh, both of them were long seen as the models for economic and political developments. They did, went, and still go to Oxbridge, Harvard, and so on. Of course, they did many disastrous things like colonialism wars, interventions, and so on, but 
At the same time, they were generally um, regarded as the homelands for modern ideas and forces. In other words, they used to have some, of to, uh, some power to persuade others that what they do contains something right, uh, not only for themselves, but also for others too. <clears throat> I call this as the indicative power, an essential element for hegemony. Well, well, this last element was largely lost long ago in the case of the United Kingdom, and any residual respect uh, that it may have has gone with Brexit, perhaps. But uh, more seriously, it, it is being eroded uh, day by day and rapidly in the United States with Mr. Trump in power. Now, uh, here, um, I would uh, uh, be obliged to uh, mention another giant called uh, China. Um, I would regard the Chinese rise would be welcome uh, if it is to be peaceful and accompanied by a transition to liberal democratic regime. And it is not. Uh, I'm not going to say uh, anything about military build-ups uh, uh, you know, in South China Sea, East China Sea today. That is not the topic today. I'm not going to say anything about the suppressions and the infiltrations taking place in Uruguay, uh, sorry, uh, Uyghur, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and so on. And I'm not going to say anything about the colleague of mine at Hokkaido University who was detained for two months you know, um, on his academic mission just to present his uh, you know, historical studies at the invitation of the State Control Research Institute called China Academy of Social Science. Now, simply, uh, the regime got worse uh, in terms of human rights record, records under Mr. Xi Jinping. What is important for today's theme is that the same regime uh, has started to build the very fabric of hegemonic nature, telecommunications, transport, and finance. Belt and Road Initiative by Mr. Xi Jinping is a combination of transport infrastructure building, and finance. If you control the switchboard of carrying goods and services, and perhaps finance, it is touching upon one of the pillars of, uh, of hegemony, that is socioeconomic fabric of the global reach. Um, uh, let other nations borrow money, build roads and railways for transport, and rule. If one will, one could easily find one or two bottlenecks uh, and they use them to block the flow of goods, services, and finance. But you may find this sort of scenario too alerting, uh, but it is not entirely unfounded. If you look at the history of weaponizing the trade, for instance, back in 2010, when China effectively blocked the export of industrial, industrially vital rare metals to Japan, and took, in fact, the hostage of four private companies, employees, by the way. This was a sort of rebuttal to the law enforcement to the drunken captain who hit the Coast Guard uh, ship, uh, public property of Japan, in the territory of Japan. Well, in this regard, the connectivity based on, this, on sustainability, free and open access is a risk hedging exercise uh, to run counter to the hegemony building of China uh, by pluralizing the routes and by checking their projects. But equally, the establishing the 5G telecommunication infrastructure can be seen touching upon a pillar of um, hegemony. Uh, <clears throat> as it is, uh, uh, it is holding the key to the contemporary switchboard. Just like the undersea cables in the 19th century, television and cable and satellite networks in the 20th century. Here too, 
we need efforts to pluralize the infrastructures so that the telecommunication remains free and accessible. Although we don't talk about it today, Digital UN also has the potential to challenge the US hegemony in the financial and banking sector too. It is because overseas remittances uh, currently made via Wall Street banking accounts could well be bypassed so that the US could well lose the control of financial switchboards. In the future, it might not be possible for, the, for them to pose financial sanctions as today. Now, <clears throat> having said that, <clears throat> I'm referring to the last line. <clears throat> China has a regime problem. It is one party dictator dictatorial and authoritarian uh, uh, by nature. Uh, recently, it is increasingly repressive. Uh, inclined to individual worship, ethnic cleansing, and human rights suppressions. Now, in other words, China cannot command the indicative power, a power to persuade others of its, its righteousness, righteousness. The model is not seeing something right for other peoples. So I uh, would um, estimate that the um, uh, well, as it stands, China wouldn't be able to become a worldwide global hegemon, but the, with this 5Gs and the you know, Belt and Road type of um, uh, uh, exercises, it is touching upon the element of hegemony building. Now, EU-Japan connectivity partnership uh, could be situated in this context too. Of course, it could be situated in many other uh, contexts as well, like enhancing uh, competitiveness, uh, innovations, and so on. But I'm situating here in the context of uh, hegemony. It is an exercise to check and mitigate the potential, uh, potential control of basic infrastructure, 21st century switchboards, and an attempt of hegemonic building by close authoritarian regimes. Now, <clears throat> let me uh, turn to a uh, sort of um, uh, brighter side of EU-Japan. <clears throat> and I was referring to some negative <laughs> aspects uh, on which to build the EU-Japan partnership, but I think we need some positive philosophy in trying to guide, guide through the com complexity of this co cooperation between Japan and the EU. Um, the, I would call this um, um, alternative, alternative positive philosophy as the principle to harmonize up. Now, uh, this principle is basically yours. Uh, it's origined from the uh, EC integration in the, in the mid-1980s. It is meant to maintain the higher uh, quality standards, not to let the lower them, especially in the areas of environment and safety, including food safety, product safety, and so on. It is it was initially advocated by Denmark, as far as I learned from the study of the history of European integration. And uh, the Denmark, Danish initiative was backed up by the, uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, at that time West Germany, uh, and accepted by then uh, the European community in uh, late uh, 1985 when the EC member states negotiated uh, the completion of, what is it, the Single European Act and completion of the internal market uh, and the liberalization of non-tariff barriers and so on. Later, the EU established itself as the regulatory power upholding the higher ecological and social standards while liberalizing trade in an increasingly globalized world. Well, a relatively small force like Denmark 
uh, in belatedly uh, joining the internal market <coughs> negotiation. Denmark was, in fact, hesitant in joining the negotiation of single uh, European Act uh, and the internal market completion. Fearful of the cheap and lesser goods and services coming from the south, Italy and Greece and so on. Uh, but uh, the Denmark was uh, <coughs> persuaded others, especially uh, West Germany, on the universal need to retain the high quality standards and regulations in environmental and safety areas. And uh, this uh, sort of universal flag that Denmark tried to protect its industry, already accustomed to the higher standard, by transnationally appealing to the like-minded peoples who care for ecology and safety. This was a new cross-national politics by a developed nation trying to protect its quality industry and society. Thus, principle to harmonize up is of European origin. Um, yet it fits nicely Japan too um, as, the social, as a socially matured economy, uh, just like in Europe too. Well, I personally took a small initiative trying to insert this spirit, uh, spirit uh, uh, into the uh, you know, Japan-related uh, uh, initiatives. And when I was invited to make um, uh, presentations uh, based on my co-edited co -edited book that I just introduced on the EU's regulatory power, uh, to uh, to Keidanlen, the big businesses association uh, in Japan, uh, I put forward this principle uh, to uh, those uh, the bosses of uh, uh, big businesses. And if you look at the 2015 proposal on EU Japan regulatory cooperation by Keidanlen. It's clear that the Japanese businesses also uh, wish to retain the high-level standards uh, by harmonizing them with the EU side. Well, both of Japan and EU are developed, socially mature, liberal democracies. If we wish to keep our democracies, human rights, quality of life, not allow, allowing the depreciation in those values, I firmly believe that the Europe and Japan should cooperate each more, uh, each other more, not less. So by uh, way of conclusion, I uh, would like to re reiterate three points. EU Japan, having had a long history of cooperation, has reached a new stage by concluding EPA-SPA with ample room for enhancing partnership as, as we enter into the era in which connectivity and innovations are increasingly important in establishing the key infrastructures, hence the hegemony in the future, we have more incentive to cooperate. And given the depreciated pressures here and there from human rights to the uh, quality infrastructure, uh, Europe and Japan as mature economies and democracies would benefit from forming a sort of union of Harmonize Up. I stop my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lando. It was an excellent, fantastic uh, opening statement, a frame for, for the debate. And uh, we now move to our first uh, session, uh, Opportunities and Challenges of Data Economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I want to say that I'm thrilled to be here because uh, I, I really think this is an important topic and we have such amazing experts. So thank you to the Institute Elcano for inviting me to moderate uh, this panel. And uh, 
I really believe that you came here to, to hear the speaker, so I'm not going to add, even if uh, the previous uh, speaker have gave me so many ideas. So first of all, uh, let me introduce Andres Ortega. Uh, he's a senior uh, research fellow from the uh, Real Instituto Elcano. He has also have, um, he has an amazing CV, so I'm not going to go into the detail, but he has had government posts, and I think that because we are here, we also have to say that he has been a correspondent in such interesting places as Brussels or London. He has a keen interest on uh, the regulation of AI, so I think that taking into account he's such a great communicator, it's great that he's going to explain to us what is this uh, concept of Society 5.0. And I just gonna give him the floor and learn. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much for everybody to, for coming here and to for the organizers to organize this. Uh, I think with Society 5.0, uh, with this concept, which was launched in two, 2015, Japan was one of the first to put forward the general proposal of a human centric or society-centric uh, approach to the present and the future of the technological revolution, what we now usually call the fourth industrial revolution. I think it was a push by the government, but also by the business federation, Keindaren, Keindaren, so, I, I don't know if I pronounce it well, who produces that. And I think it's important that that was a public-private initiative uh, because that kind of public-private cooperation, uh, we have to follow it now in, in those days uh, when uh, not only governments are needed, but also companies and other actors in, in, the, in, the, in the governance of, of this uh, industrial revolution. No? I think the, the idea of the Society 5.0 has entered the international stage, even at the G20 level, no? thanks to the Japanese presidency last year. And it has got a, a global push. Why 5.0? First, uh, because the first one was the society of hunting and gathering. Two was the agriculture, three was the industrial, and four was the information society. You know? What does society 5.0 mean? Uh, I think it's the integration of cyberspace with the physical space, which is the real world, no? in which uh, different from the, the information times, uh, the, the 4.0, 4 the creation of knowledge will be done mainly from machines. It's an ideal state, in the sense not of an ideal in, in value terms, but uh, of, of Max Weber in, in a way. No? But also, I think it's a policy objective. Uh, an official definition of society 5.0 is as follows. A human-centered society that balances economic progress with the resolution of social problems through a system that integrates cyberspace and physical space in an advanced way. You know? uh, which means, in the end, to build a super-intelligent society in which no one is left behind by the technological revolution. You know? Quite the contrary. Because uh, if the fourth industrial revolution is not managed well, it has all the ingredients to provoke serious disruptions and more inequality. Another def definition says that it's a society in which the diverse needs of people are finally differentiated and met by providing the necessary products and services in the required quantities to the people who need them when they need them, no? and in which all people can receive high quality service and live a comfortable and vigorous life that makes allowance for the various differences, such as age, sex, region, or language. No? It's a way of managing three fundamental changes. One is technological change, the other one is economic change, and uh, the third one is geopolitical change. Uh, it means to put uh, uh, artificial intelligence and other technologies at the service of the people, not the other way around. And it reminds me of the warning by British practitioner Havelock Ellis in, in, in 1922, which says that the greatest task of civilization today 
is to make machines what they should be, slaves, rather than masters of the men. Uh, in our days, the last book by a specialist on, on, international, on uh, artificial intelligence, such as Stuart Russell's, in his book, his latest book, which is called significantly uh, human compatible, he says that uh, intelligence of machines will be beneficial to the extent that their action can be expected to achieve our objectives, not theirs. No? Society uh, 5.0 has an horizon of 10 to 15 years. It's not such a, a long time. No? Maybe the concept lacks some long-term clear objectives, like a moonshot. No? Uh, it has no budget, but ministries have their own, and it's coordinated through uh, SIP, Inter the Interministerial Program for the Promotion of Strategic Innovation, now in its second, in, in its second stage, uh, from uh, 2018 to 22, centered on 12 challenges, among them technology centered on cyberspace and physical realms, realms creation of a safe society of Internet of Things, autonomous driving, materials, quantum technology, agriculture, and uh, biotechnology, energy and the environment, prevention and management of disaster, health, and oceanic, uh, oceanic uh, technologies, and others. No? Uh, I think that society 5.0 as a concept is a central element of other strategies, like the innovation strategy of 2018 and the, the artificial intelligence uh, uh, strategy of uh, last year, no? which is deeply related. They are deeply related. Uh, I think Japan has an artificial intelligence technology strategy that also uh, included uh, artificial intelligence in its integrated innovation strategy. No? The Japanese artificial intelligence strategy also includes social principles in line with those of society 5.0. First uh, and foremost, as I have been pointing out, it must be centered on the human beings uh, towards our, our comeback. It, it has also been introduced in the OECD <laughs> and, and the G20 concept. It also uh, is meant to apply to the Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. No? And also to see how the use of technology might facilitate not all, but some of these goals. I think in Japan, all this, with all this, culture helps. No? Uh, for example, there is no rejection, but love of robots, of technology in Japan, due, I think, to their culture uh, uh, the, the cultural religion, Shintoism, the experience of the image of robots in comics and films, uh, they used to help humans, uh, not to be a problem for humans, as, as in the West, and also uh, because of the problems of demography, uh, which are shared now with Europe, the, the grain of, of the society, and also a matter of competitivity, or competitivity no? uh, uh, as a way to how to compete with the uh, strategy made in China 2025, which uh, uh, everybody, I think, uh, is looking at. No? I think it's also separated from military research, also for cultural and historical reasons, which is different from the approach uh, sometimes it's taken in Europe, and uh, very often it's taken in the United States. No? But I think that we share between uh, the Europeans and, and, and the Japanese a worry, uh, as everywhere, with the impact on jobs. No? I think that over 60% of the population uh, fear that uh, automation in general will impact uh, on our jobs. So I think in this way, it's thought that it must not replace, but also enhance human works, capacity, and creativity uh, through augmented or machine-empowered society. I think we also share a lack of skills. Uh, we share the problems. And uh, we are very interested here in, uh, in the Japanese program uh, by the, the METI 
to retrain in uh, artificial intelligence uh, mature engineers, for example, by making them take course, courses of uh, three to six months or, or a year. And I think we are uh, also looking at that in, uh, in Spain, you know, uh, where the government is, is uh, putting finishing touches to a national strategy of skill, competencias, we call it here, directed not only to professionals, but also to public administration and to citizens, because we are far behind in terms of uh, skills by the citizens, the digital skills by, by the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the citizens. No? I think the, this kind of approaches favor closer uh, EU-Japan ties. We share some problems with data, not just with privacy, but also with ownership of data, and also with cloud services, no? dominated by the US and Chinese companies. Uh, Brussels wants to mobilize uh, 1.6 billion euros to create a single space for data and invest in European clouds. Uh, yesterday, the Commission put forward some three uh, strategy, but one of them was a strategy for, for data. No? Uh, I think we need to cooperate in regulation and to to have more multilateralism and all that. And I think it's time to align ourselves on digital governance and bring on board uh, the US and other countries uh, of the world. No? The, this idea of human-centered future society is part of the G20, the so-called G20 Osaka track. And uh, it has been incorporated in the G20 uh, artificial intelligence principles, no? which are uh, based on, on how to, to achieve uh, responsible stewardship on trustworthy uh, artificial intelligence. I think trust is the main issue. And they include inclusive growth, sustainable de uh, development and well-being, human-centered values and fairness, human rights, transparency and explainability, robustness, security and safety, and uh, accountability. But these principles are not compulsory. And we see that some countries, some G20 countries, have adopted uh, those principles that include privacy, but I think we don't share the concept of what is behind privacy in Europe. I think it's different from and in Japan, from the US or from China. No? Uh, as I said yesterday, uh, the European Commission adopted a whole package, a white paper on artificial intelligence, a communication on data, and some general ideas on digitalization uh, with some proposals. No? I think it presents a European society powered by digital solutions that put people first, opens opens up new opportunities for business and boosts the development of trustworthy technology to foster an open and democratic society and a sustainable and vibrant uh, economy. You know? Digital is a key, key, uh, key enabler. But I think it focused maybe too much on more than a general concept, which is lacking, I think, like Society uh, 5.0. It focused a lot on regulation and investment, uh, and it's that way oriented. But the language is very similar to Japan and the ideas behind it. No? Uh, for example, the Japan uh, AI strategy uh, takes nine principles. The principle of collaboration, of transparency, of controllability, of safety, of security, of privacy, of ethics, respect to human dignity and individual autonomy, of users' assistance and accountability. The guidelines of the EU present seven key requirements for uh, EU artificial intelligence, which is human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data and governance, transparency, diversity, no discrimination and fairness, societal and environment, <coughs> environmental well-being, and accountability. You know? Uh, so I think the, 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 there is there a, a lot of room to, to share. But we 
not only need to share the, the principles, but also I think it's a question of leading the technological content of uh, the regulation of AI, and also what's called the value-based design, or the responsible research and development, uh, which is uh, also well addressed by the European Digital uh, uh, Agenda, and it's part of the Japanese uh, culture. I think we have common problems to share, aging society, competitivity, competition by other countries. We have a common language. We must f forward the partnership, and we feel a bit squeezed between the US and China. That doesn't mean to be in our cooperation anti-American or anti-Chinese, but uh, the Japan and the EU, or Europe, as uh, extension now that Brexit, uh, that, that the UK is out because of Brexit, we have to work close together on these issues. Uh, society 5.0 and the European concept uh, of a human or society centric have to have a high degree of autonomy, uh, not of independence in an interdependent world. I think it's a, it's a challenge for us that others set the standards and declarations for them. No? Europe sees itself as a regulatory superpower, and it has had some successes in terms of competition policy, but in terms also of GDPR. But uh, the, the regulation of data through G GDPR now, I think, is a pre-last phase of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and big data which I think needs to be revised and also revised in the light uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, its, its effect on, in, in, in the life of people. No? I think in, uh, in terms of standards, our trading partners have joined the EU-led process that uh, successfully set global standards for 5G and the Internet uh, uh, of Things. And... Uh, I think Europe now wants to lead in the adoption and standardization process of the new generation of technology, blockchain, supercomputing, uh, quantum technology, algorithms, and tools to allow data sharing and data users, no? uh, 5G, 6G, and the other things. No? In Japan, or from Japan, Prime Minister Abe, uh, was very useful in setting up, as the ambassador said before, in Davos last year, the concept of data free flow with trust that also found its way in the G20, in the Osaka Declaration on the Digital Economy, which is going, I think, to be very useful in the WTO context for uh, e-commerce regulation. No? Uh, and I think it's in line with proposals uh, of, uh, of, um, of that. I think the EU uh, is now ready to, or, or yesterday it proposed, or it, it said that it was going to propose a data <coughs> act for 2021 uh, after, but I think we all need uh, cooperation with other countries and especially with Japan. No? I think we are too small in Europe. Even the U.S. is too small no? for, for the competition that is coming from other countries or, or other areas. No? And I think we need to work together also in regulation, even if we don't need exactly the same regulations, but to make things that are interoperable. Interoperability, I think, is a key word for this cooperation of the present and uh, the future. I finish. I think we are at the beginning of a revolution. It is very positive to have all these well-intentioned concepts, but we are in a great transition, and we need to translate these concepts in policy, and even, which is even more difficult, in coding and programming. You know? But I think Japan and the EU have a clear and vastly coincidental ideas of where to go. Thank you. So So now that we have a very clear idea of what society point, uh, 
society 5.0 is. Uh, let me introduce uh, Maike Okano Heimaz, who is a senior research fellow in the Kligendal Institute, which is a really uh, very prestigious foreign affairs institute, like El Cano. And uh, she is an expert on economic diplo diplomacy and international relations of East Asia. So I think that she can take us further uh, in this uh, journey on the relation between the EU and Japan and how this can impact uh, in the digital field. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, thank you uh, to colleagues of, and friends of Elcano Institute for having me here. It's a great pleasure. Um, to be in Madrid and to share uh, uh, thoughts on this very important topic and to see so many people here. Um, honestly, this is, uh, I've, I've been working, as you said, on EU-Asia relations and mostly political economic stuff uh, in the past 15 years uh, at Klingendal and I've never seen this much interest in EU-Japan relations. And I think it's, it's owing to some negative external factors that I would like to discuss. Um, but I, uh, but I, th I very much agree with Professor Endo that it's, uh, it's the positives uh, that we have to, the positive philosophy um, that we have to now develop together as a way of taking this forward. Um, so it's uh, to me very remarkable to see uh, so many people here uh, and to sort of be able to get back to my original expertise which was uh, Japan. I spent most of the time that I lived in Asia in Japan. Uh, but then working at a think tank in the Netherlands, there was, there was no interest in Japan as such. It was China, China, and China, to the extent that there was an interest in Asia at all. Um, so that's uh, clearly changing now, thanks to China, um, and thanks to the fact that we are now realizing that we need an indirect approach to dealing with some of the challenges that come from the rise of China. Of course, the opportunities are best reaped bilaterally, and let's not forget there's many opportunities to be reaped. Um, but in Europe, we've long denied that there are challenges. Um, and, and I know that our Japanese friends have been quite frustrated with that, uh, because for them, China is the next big door neighbor, and we all know the big or the smaller neighbors that you have geographically are often the most problematic ones, right? Um, for Spain, for the Netherlands, it goes for countries in Europe as it goes for countries in Asia. Um, and I think uh, Japan today has a little bit more reason than most countries in Europe to be worried uh, about its big neighbor. Um, so I've been intrigued by the fact that Japan has always been uh, engaging China at the same time as taking a realistic approach um, to again deal with some of the challenges that come from that big country. And of course those lie mostly uh, with the fact that it is not an open, not a transparent society, um, that it has a, a government that is uh, not, or it has a political party actually that, that's present everywhere. Um, it's, it's present in the media, it's present in companies. And how do you deal with uh, a, com a country like that that is gaining uh, increasingly more influence um, in, in the world? I think that is actually one of the key reasons why we are together. Um, that's the C, I would say, the China. Um, but there's an ABC for why we are here. Um, I'm borrowing that from my friend Shada Islam from Friends of Europe. The ABC is America, Brexit and China. Um, China, I just explained. Brexit is, of course, another reason because Japanese companies have been very, uh, and the government, I think, have been very familiar with uh, the UK, which is also an island country, um, attached but detached uh, from, the, from the continent or from, from Asia or from the EU. Um, and, and they've invested heavily in the UK, and now that the UK is leaving the EU, um, there's reasons to be involved in other capitals more than before. So that's, uh, even to me, from a small country like the Netherlands, an opportunity coming from Brexit. Um, and, and having our Japanese friends closer and more interested. Um, the A, I think, is also uh, not to be lightly taken. Uh, that's the United States, of course, under current President Trump. Uh, which has taken a course that is very confrontational of China. Um, and, ex or, um, and this, I think, is a shared concern of Japan and the EU, which has brought the political momentum to bigger cooperation between the EU and Japan. Um, because we share the concern with the United States, but we don't share their inclination for the overly confrontational um, approach. And that's not just tweeting. Of course, it's also in real action on the trade war that has been all over 
um, the newspapers, but underlying that, much more the technological conflict, um, which I think is, is the real, really, the long-term challenge in the uh, US-China conflict that we see unfolding even just now uh, before us. Um, and in this technological conflict, of course, digital and data field is, is extremely important, and that's, I think, why it's so important that we are here uh, today talking this through. Because the EU and Japan, yes, as, as diplomats um, uh, love to share, and I also like to emphasize, we share norms and values with Japan. Um, but let's also not deny that we have very different approaches and that we have very different priorities. As I said, China is a recently, only recently a priority for most countries in Europe, uh, beyond the economic opportunity that it has been for decades. Um, but it's only recently a political uh, priority. I mean, look at the European Council. Um, we've had debates on China, I think, well, after the Tiananmen Square incident or uh, in, in 1989, uh, only very recently uh, for the second time. That is rather shocking to me. Um, as I said, China at, uh, at the think tank uh, that I work at, Klingendal in the Netherlands, China has been on the agenda, um, but also uh, in a very small way compared to security issues that have dominated our agenda, EU internal stuff, uh, which is natural. Um, but the world is changing, so we have to change with it. And I think there's great learning opportunities also um, from the engaging but not endorsing approach that Japan has been taking over the past decades. Um, so we need that sort of engagement on each other's strategic thought. And I think that's why opportunities like this are so valuable uh, for us to get to know each other um, and to understand why we do differently, how complicated the EU really is. I mean, we sometimes tend to forget, uh, but even you, for us Europeans, the EU is a complicated beast. So if we talk EU-Japan, that's overlooking um, the, the complexities what, that are ingrained in this, just this one word, EU, right? Um, we have to uh, also um, assist, I think, our Japanese friends in, in working with EU and EU member states at the same time. Because the topic of connectivity that is on the, on the agenda today, it's wonderful, I think, that we have this uh, last September, the EU-Japan connectivity agenda agreed. Um, but let's face it, the EU does not have companies. There's European member states that have companies, right? So if companies are going to be key players um, with banks, development banks, infrastructure banks, um, and together with other stakeholders, it's going to have to be the EU member states that are going to be implementing this. So we cannot just be, uh, be happy, or we should be happy, but we cannot just wait then for things to happen because we have an EU-Japan partnership now on connectivity. We have to work harder to get all the member states involved. So again, that's why I'm very happy that in, I see um, in, in recent months, a lot of activity uh, thanks to Japanese embassies in European member states um, in, in Europe in having this debate. So that's a very long introduction, I should say, on why, <laughs> why I, I'm glad to be here. Um, the, the Society 5.0, um, as Andres was, was discussing, um, I would, uh, again, link that, like to link that to the digital field. Um, because it's, of course, Society 5.0 that came with the fourth industrial revolution that we are currently in, right? That's the reason why Japan was starting to think through what does that mean for humanity, for societies. Um, and how can we make sure that with all this rapid technological development, that our societies uh, and the policies we devise for it are not going to be technology-centered, but they're going to be people-centered, human-centered, right? That's the real aim. Because we live in a world where the United States, frankly speaking, we diverge from the United States approach, which puts big tech companies first. We also diverge from the Chinese approach, which puts the state first in handling data and in digital governance. And the EU and Japan converge on the fact uh, that we want people to be first, right? And uh, in, in, for the European Union, that became very clear when we devised the GDPR, the, the data protection for individuals, right? And the regulation for that, that has been extremely complicated. I was just asked to sign a form, actually, for my data um, that to be shared on, on whatever is going to be communicated outside today. So that's a, that's a complicated thing. But this is the EU approach, putting people first. And, the e and Japan has a similar approach. 
Um, so that, I think, is, is an important starting point for why we do converge, again, on norms and values, but we differ on approaches. Because, yes, next to the connectivity partnership, next to the economic partnership agreement, the, the, the political agreement that we also have in place, there was also this mutual adequacy decision for data, personal data transfer between Japan and the EU that was uh, um, adopted last year. And I think that's important, but it's also important to realize that took a little bit of effort for the Japanese uh, way of protecting personal data and the European way of doing that to, to talk through ways to, to how to converge and how to accept that what you do, we think is trustworthy and uh, what, they, what the others also do is trustworthy. So also in the field of data, there are still many debates to be had. And what I would like to do um, in the few minutes that I have left, because I do want to leave uh, room for questions, which I always value, um, is, is to, to basically unpack some of the what I call digital connectivity. The EU-Japan connectivity partnership um, is, of course, values-based. It's sustainable connectivity. It's rules-based connectivity. Uh, okay, but then what, right? Um, because the how is important, but then you have to get to action, and the question is what? Um, we know on infrastructure, many things are already happening. Rails, um, ports are being built, energy grids are being built. The EU has been uh, great, I think, also in doing that in the EU itself, in, in the Western Balkans, through its uh, long-standing TEN-T network. Um, so we have quite a lot of uh, things done in the important fields of infrastructure, in energy, and human is the third field. Uh, where I also see actually quite a bit of action ongoing, the fact that we are here. Could, you could call human connectivity, right? So the one remaining field where we see, to my, extent, to my view, less action is digital connectivity. And what is digital connectivity? I would like to unpack that in, in three fields. It's regulation, where you could say, of course, the EU and Japan are doing uh, quite well. We are on track. Um, and I can say more about that. DFFT, the digital free flow with trust, or the data free flow with trust, uh, was mentioned already. The GDPR um, and the mutual adequacy decisions were, was mentioned already. Um, so there we are doing quite well. But it was an interesting article by uh, the Bruegel director earlier this week, an opinion article that had the beautiful title, Referees Don't Win, right? We can be the world's global referee, um, but we also need companies that will provide, um, that will be able to spread norms beyond EU borders. Because we can be a referee within EU borders and within Japan, but you cannot be a referee in third countries, in Africa or in other Southeast Asian countries. You have to have something on offer. And who can be the tools or the instruments to do that? It's the companies. And that's when you get to the business element of digital connectivity, which is the second element, where Japan and, and the EU clearly have not been doing so well, right? It's the platform uh, companies of GAFA, the Google, Facebook, Amazon, from the United States. It's Alibaba, Tencent, and Chinese companies that have been extremely successful here. And frankly speaking, the EU and Japan lost the game, right? So now, in the next phase of this, for the industrial data battle, I think we have to do much better. This is where I see the added value of the strategies that came out from the, uh, from the EU, uh, where I also see uh, Japan uh, working on innovation strategies on AI, uh, artificial intelligence, um, and on making sure that the promising tech companies, the small and medium-sized tech companies or the startups that we have are not bought out by a Chinese or by an American group. Right? It seems to have been sort of for European governments okay, and for European small uh, startups an ideal to, to be bought by Google. That's a sort of a definition of then you are successful. And that's a sad story because then we lose our own industrial capacity here. Right? So we have to work harder and have to exchange opinions, I think, on how to do better on that front. Um, because both the EU and Japan um, are, are uh, well, they share this challenge, and they share the value of what sort of innovation we want most, the ethical AI. I cannot really unpack the debate now, but there's a whole debate behind ethics related uh, to artificial intelligence, right? Um, 
So the business, the business part uh, of, of digital connectivity is not going so well. The regulatory part is going well. And then the third part is the, is the infrastructure. And then the telecommunications infrastructure, of course, you will think of 5G. Uh, and here, um, and, the, and the link, of course, with the cybersecurity. Um, because the, there's a hard infrastructure um, element to it where we have to build um, well, the satellite communications, uh, we have to build the, the, the submarine cables, um, the digital networks in our own countries, and everybody has been asking ourselves the question, should we work with Huawei, right? Should we have Huawei in or out, ban or not to ban? And I think here, actually the ban or not to ban, um, binary has been the European approach in Japan. I think it's beautiful the way it was done. Because there was no talk of a ban, but Huawei was kept out. And it was done in a, in a very smooth way that we did not have the, the irritating discussion, I, I personally think, that we've had here in Europe. Um, how to avoid that is, I think, even one thing. And why you would want to avoid that um, is, is another thing that we could learn from, from Japan. Obviously, Japan's not going to tell us what we should do with 5G, well, the Americans have been doing that, uh, but the, Amer uh, the Japanese prefer not to take that approach. Um, but in, and of course, also Japan has been pressured by the Americans not to go with Huawei. Uh, but in the end, it, they came up with a very elegant solution of saying, no, for our national security concerns, we want trusted partners. And Huawei is just not one of them, right? So, but it all costs much less political capital, I would say, in Japan rather than here. So we have very similar challenges ongoing um, that we can have much more uh, engagement on. Um, then of, uh, finally, uh, because I realize I'm running out of time, a point that I, I don't want to leave unmentioned is the third party element of this. Um, as I said, I think there's a need for, uh, for more strategic engagement on, on cybersecurity and, and telecommunications networks, also on how to do better on business. Uh, element of, uh, of digital connectivity. On regulations, there's already the global element, but the third country elements. What about developing countries that also have to make a choice for Huawei or not Huawei? To accept data companies, uh, or companies like, uh, like um, Uber, um, that might be taxi companies, but also companies that gather data and that can be shared uh, to uh, that can be shared with uh, the United, back, that can go back to the United States, uh, which can help then develop this uh, this industry further. In Singapore, uh, where when I was there last year, already Uber was kicked out. It was Chinese Didi that was uh, the most successful there, and it's that company bringing back data to the Chinese state uh, that can help on many other uh, well, ways of furthering um, data and uh, development and, and e-commerce that comes from it. Um, I think there are certain norms and values that come with decisions that you take on this. And we want third countries to also stick with our approach rather than be okay with transferring all data to the state or transferring all data to big tech companies. So the third market uh, approach is very important and this is what I call the digital ODA uh, challenge the Digital Development Assistance Challenge, um, where you have to also engage with third countries on regulation. You want all this also how to establish a secure data protection in those countries. Can we help with technical assistance, those countries, to also have systems that we think are, keep, are human centered rather than state centered or, or tech company centered? Um, I think it needs more investment also in, through our development assistance programs to help third countries in making the right choice for their people in the long term. Of course, it also goes for business. Data for development, digital financial inclusions are huge agendas that we can also, we have to work on together in third countries. So I was very happy to hear Ambassador uh, just say, uh, just mention this cooperation also with India, because India has huge experience here in domestic digital financial inclusion agenda. If we can take that to third countries, um, that's also a way um, to spread um, uh, our values and to have hopefully convergence of norms uh, that we can adhere to. Um, so conclusion, I think EU and Japan have come a very long way. 
um, but we need to deepen and broaden the, the, the cooperation on digital connectivity in particular, um, make cooperation truly global and extend it to third countries. Um, so that's... That's a great way to finish because uh, I will give the floor now to Makoto Yokosawa, who is a professor at the Kyoto University. He's a technologist, but we can also uh, take advantage of the fact that he has been in many of these uh, multilateral negotiations to regulate all these uh, things related to the digital field in the World Trade Organization, in the OCD, and so on, and how he's going to explain to us how Japan is trying to take this uh, initiatives like we have already uh, mentioned the data free flow with trust and uh, explain us a little bit more about this so it really goes uh, smoothly from one speaker to the next. Okay, so thank you Anna and thank you very much for the Lucano Foundation for in, in inviting me to very precious meeting. It's very, actually this is, this is my honor to be here and speak about the uh, my experience and my uh, knowledge uh, idea about the, the data flow and society 5.0. Yes, um, as Anna has uh, nicely introduced me, uh, I am uh, co-chairing the uh, Business Advisory Committee to the OECD, and the, also I have some experience to join the APEC, which I want to uh, take a note about uh, a little bit about uh, later and the uh, WTO e-commerce negotiation, and the Japanese government and Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs Communication and the Ministry of, of Economy and Trade and Investment uh, in Industry. Uh, I have many chance to talk about with them. And moreover, the, um, uh, Andre, Andres has kindly introduced to me as I have uh, chairing uh, some working group in Keidan Ren. Uh, this is a Japan Federal Business Federation. So uh, it's, uh, uh, I have many hats. So virtually uh, <laughs> in, in government, I, have, uh, I am a fellow at the NIDO, uh, which uh, most of you have, have heard of, that, that the new energy and the industry development organization under METI. This is a governmental research institute. And the, uh, I also, I have a business hat, and I have an academic hat in Kyoto University, so uh, three hats on my head <laughs> without hair. <laughs> Sorry. And the, um, I, I changed my strategy to have a 10 minute speech here. I, I have prepared to read my um, manuscript, but rather than that, I would like to comment on the, the two precious spe previous speakers uh, has so nicely demographed. Uh, uh, stated about the society 5.0 and the, some of the geopolitical things and the, some proposal to the EU-Japan collaboration. And uh, so uh, let me speak with the, the society 5.0. Yes, and as, uh, as uh, Andres kindly said that the Keidan Ren, Japan Business Federation has spent a uh, lot of years and lots of effort in proposing uh, so how the society 5.0 will look like from the business perspective. Okay. So uh, the good outcome is uh, last year in B20, Kedan Den has uh, hosted a B20 process, a whole process to the uh, B20, G20 leaders. And the, uh, they had a very nice report. You can search on the web on the Kedan Den homepage. And what is the difference from the, the government, G20, uh, government society 5.0 and the private sector 5.0 is Kedan Ren is paying attention, much more attention on the SDGs, Sustainable <coughs> Development Goals. Oh well, yes, and government is also taking uh, some attention to these SDGs, but uh, more precisely, more practically, we are just uh, uh, designing how we can support the SDGs by the society 5.0 concept. Uh, I will take uh, uh, three examples for the, uh, the SDG number two, which is the uh, zero uh, hunger. Okay, so here, Keidan Ren, Japan business, with a cooperation with the B20 uh, countries, including Spain and the European Union, 
uh, I, we want boosting the food production by smart agriculture. Okay. So uh, actually, a digital technology, a digital data, and the data free flow of trust is here. So we can share the knowledge in the agriculture process and how we can make the maximum crop from the, the, uh, the, the, uh, in, in the various stage of the uh, global uh, agriculture process. So uh, this is a you know, knowledge transfer, a knowledge and sharing uh, by the data. So uh, this is a, the very good example in the, uh, how the Society 5.0, uh, the new technology can help the SDGs to be solved. And the second, uh, second example should be the SDG number three, good health and good well-being, okay? So I have to mention about the coronavirus here, okay? So in, in Japan, and as you might know, uh, we have more than 50 people infected in the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, 2019. So uh, unfortunately, we had a large cruiser ship uh, in the port Yokohama, where I was born, and they have uh, more than the five, 500 people infected. So, uh, and apart from that, we have this more than 60 people in uh, domestic, uh, in Tokyo area, and Hokkaido area, and many, uh, anywhere in the Japan. So this is a number three infection in the world. Number one is, of course, in China, more than 7,000 7, people. And, uh, what, where do you think that the number two country on the infection of the coronavirus? Just Singapore, okay? So uh, it's not a Thailand, or not, it's not a Vietnam, or it's not a uh, uh, Myanmar, which is very close to uh, prox uh, proximity, the distance is very close to China. It's Singapore. So uh, I call this a digital pandemic. I am uh, writing some, uh, some uh, article to the, the magazine, it's a Japanese magazine, and I, I said this is a digital pandemic. <clears throat> Why? This is a, one reason, there's a two reasons for the digital pandi pandemic. One is the Chinese government's <coughs> policy. Uh, as you might know, a Chinese uh, uh, freedom of speech is a very, very, you know, uh, they have some good program, very, 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 very bad program here in, in the freedom of speech. So the reason why we had this pandemic, the one of the reasons is the uh, one doctor in the Wuhan city tried to spread uh, the warning of this uh, upon, uh, coronavirus to or to nationwide, and you might know you, the China has some specific uh, SNS social network system. It's not from the, uh, the Twitter or the Facebook. So we are prohibited to use those uh, Western style uh, social network system. So uh, the, there was a, a severe uh, censor by the government. So the doctor, couldn't spread that warning to the entire the nation. So they managed, somebody managed to use a VPN, that's a virtual private network, and they posted that the message to the, the Twitter. Then the Chinese people and all or the people in the, all of the, in the other part of the world has known that the, the, the dangerous situation of the coronavirus. So, Okay, so this is a, a, a story here now we are facing. And, but the, 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 for, if you think about the SDG number three, uh, this is the, uh, we can use the, the uh, digital technology and digital data flow in the, uh, prohib uh, prohibiting the, the infection of the wide, wide range of the spread of the infection of such as the coronavirus 19. So, and um, we have uh, had a message like this in one year ago, but uh, we, we didn't have a power to uh, utilize this in the prohibition of the, the coronavirus. So that's a sad, sad story.
So uh, look at the SDG five, that's the, uh, the gender equality. Okay. So uh, the here, uh, Kaden Ren has proposed empowering human power by using the digital technology in terms of the, the uh, good education or skill development. So such and such, uh, the all of the society 5.0, uh, that uh, implementation is based on the SDG, how we can, uh, the, the idea, how we can tackle with the SDGs. So that's one message. And the second one, this is uh, Andreas. Uh, Andreas has mentioned about the smart cities. Yes, smart city is uh, a miniature of the society 5.0, okay? So uh, society itself is very, very large and very, very complicated and a huge ecosystem here. And we have to talk with the existing ecosystem, you know. So, uh, so the smart city, the city scale, a smaller scale of the society or community is a very good idea to talk I think about how the whole nationwide <coughs> society 5.0 will look like. But here, and mentioning to your comment about China, uh, and, and the, uh, mm -hmm. yes, and uh, the ambassador, Japanese ambassador has uh, talked about is the Belt and Road in initiatives. Yes, China has here uh, a very good strategy in the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, about the smart cities. Okay, they even have that. And the, uh, amazingly, uh, many, many people, over 56 countries, has uh, some relationship with China in terms of the smart city development, even in here, Spain. And uh, Japan has already have uh, some uh, collaboration with China in terms of the smart cities, Australia, and all of the smart Southeast Asian countries. So China is doing something. So how about us? So uh, Ambassador has mentioned about the free and open Indo-Pacific. This is a very good uh, example of how we can think about the, uh, the China's, uh, China's Belt and Road Initiatives. So uh, USA, United States and Japan has a periodical meeting about the FOIP, FOIP, free and open Indo-Pacific. So uh, we, uh, we have some plan from the Australia to the east coast of the Africa. So, um, so how we can do a similar thing with the European Union? Here, we can, we can assume uh, some triangular collaboration to tackle with the, uh, China. So this is my idea. I, I would like to hear from you about uh, any other idea or, or uh, for example, India is a very good partner for us. Okay, so, and the, uh, some other things about the, the smart the SDGs and the smart city is the AI development. Okay, so uh, next week in Paris, I have to be there. Uh, the OECD will launch a new initiatives in artificial intelligence after the OECD AI guideline. Well, five guidelines last year we have, they, they have uh, launched. And they, they have a good plan for the uh, so-called AI observatory. So uh, this is a portal site for the AI development. And uh, uh, that's a proposal from the Japanese government. And the Japanese private sector has totally agreed and supporting this. And the, if you have chance, you, you, uh, I, I recommend you visit the AI Observatory work, uh, web page, maybe uh, launched next year, next, next week, sorry. And <coughs> the, uh, yes, data privacy, yes. And AI and data privacy is two major pillar in the OECD's digital, digital economy policy discussion. Okay, uh, data, Privacy, we are now in the, in the process of the, the review of the 1980 OECD guidelines for privacy. So it, it's more than 40 years, uh, almost 40 years uh, since uh, we have this uh, OECD's guidelines. The first stage of the privacy protection legislation has begun in 1980. And 
we are now, I think it's the third stage of the privacy protection in all of the countries in the world. Japan has a 2050 APPI, which is the Act for the Personal Pri uh, Privacy Information Protection, uh, and the uh, GDPR uh, as well. And many, many uh, Southeast uh, countries are thinking of the, having a new uh, legislation for the privacy protection. So here I, I would like to emphasize what is the relationship with the DFFT and privacy protection. Okay, so uh, many people might, may uh, misunderstand data free flow with trust. It's not conditioned. It's un unconditioned free flow. The, we are not saying that the unconditional data flow, free flow. Uh, let me talk about the hist history of the DFFT. I have some experience in joining the APEC discussion about the free flow of data. We have a lot of experience in the negotiation process of the TPP, Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Partnership. And here we have three main principles in the TPP e-commerce chapter. It's a chapter number 14, TPP. So uh, the three principles, uh, free flow of data, of course, and the uh, restriction of the data localization. And thirdly, uh, the restriction of the source code access. Source code is uh, the, 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 the design paper of the, the software and data processing, okay? So here we have a lot, we have spent a lot of resources and money to develop a source code in terms of the artificial intelligence and the smart cities and many, many things. So these three principles in TPP we are following in the USMCIA and, and unfortunately we couldn't do that, the data localization and the free flow of data in the EU, Japan, EPA. Only the source code uh, restriction of the source code access was uh, integrated in the Japan EU EPA. But we have to, I, I hope we can negotiate further about uh, the other element of the, the TPP three principles in the future. So, and the, uh, <clears throat> yes, so uh, the, the, the all of the TPP three principles uh, uh, we are just thinking about is the free flow, a freedom of, and this is regarded as the, the self-regulation in other words. We are not, one, we are not uh, uh, requesting the total freedom, 100% freedom. Rather than that, we are talking about the, the co-regulation, so-called co-regulation. Uh, what is the core regulation? What is the not core regulation? Is the one is a direct regulation, and I will uh, take uh, the G GDPR as a very good example of the direct regulation. So, uh, most of the restriction is uh, is written in in the GDPR, the regulation or written rule. This is the European style. Okay. So, and the, the American style, what, are the, what about the American style? That's a self-regulation. There is a minimal law. If you think about the Wild, uh, wild West development, okay, they, if they have the law, but there's no sheriff or policeman there, so law is use, useless in the Wild, 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 wild West. So this is their culture, American culture. They will protect that by themselves. So self-regulation is the culture in the United States. So what is the core regulation? It's in between the direct regulation and the core regulation. So uh, if, you, if you know about the, the CBPR, cross-border privacy rule in the, of the APEC, Japan is supporting this. Japan is also supporting the GDPR. We have the adequacy recognition in last year, at the beginning of the last year, very happy to have that. But at the same time, we are supporting the CBPR. That's a co-regulation process of the privacy protection. So 
DFFT never means 100% freedom of the free. So here we have to think about the, the last word, T, trust. Okay. So uh, the, there's a long story how we can think about the T following the DFF data free flow. I mentioned about the APEC negotiation. So uh, firstly, Japanese government has proposed free flow of data in the APEC document. For example, the APEC tel telecommunication working group statement. But every time we propose the free flow of data phrase, China and Vietnam, Indonesia, some, some of the governments has a big opposition to this, this word. Vietnam said, uh, we will agree that if it is a free flow of business data, not the government data, not the personal data. If it is only the business data, we, they will agree, Vietnam will agree, they said. China said, this is very important. China would agree if it is a secure and free flow of data. This is very important. Secure first, free second, okay? And their wording in the secure is very, very special, very different from the European one and the or, or Japanese or even the United, American one. Their word secure is the governmental control, okay? okay. To, to achieve the secure data flow, government has something. Government has to restrict the free, uh, the data flow inside the nation and also the, the cross-border data flow from China or uh, from other part of the world to China. So, Back to the infection, coronavirus. As I said, this is the, one of the big reasons why we had this, uh, you know, uh, this uh, tragedy in beating in this year. So, uh, so this is the reason I, I choose the word digital pandemic in, in terms of the coronavirus 19. Okay. So, um, I would like to mention a little bit more, um, but the, um, maybe I would expect some good question about this, <laughs> and the, I'll be ha very happy to answer to it. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce our last speaker because I think that on all these digital matters, it's good to have a multi-stakeholder approach. So it's good to have a, a representative from the private sector. Also with Mr. Yokosawa and his three hats, he can be multi-stakeholder by himself. But we have someone coming directly from Telefonica, uh, which is Christopher Steg, the, their director of public policy and internet. And he is going to um, deal with a very interesting topic, in my opinion, which is the challenges for regulation and the possibilities for cooperation for uh, <coughs> Japan and the EU. So I give you the floor. Well, thanks very much. And uh, I will try to be brief because I think we have uh, heard a lot of really interesting interventions already. A lot of things I want to say have been mentioned. So um, I think we, I will try to, to summarize uh, my view quite a lot. Um, this is about opportunities and challenges here, the panel. And um, I believe, honestly, that um, the opportunities and challenges go close uh, together. I mean, if we don't uh, tackle the challenges well, I think there will be not many opportunities, or at least some opportunities will never arise. So uh, we will kind of need to tackle the, the challenges. Um, in Telefonica, my job is to think about technology, digitization, and how that impacts our societies and, and politics, um, and to have a longer-term vision because we know being a regulated company and a regulated sector that um, any policy change takes years and years to take place finally. So politics are, is, is, is quite slow in that sense and we have to think ahead uh, to have maybe then a couple of years the frameworks we like. Um, so one of the things we did um, already last year is so that we published something uh, which we called a digital manifesto, which is basically a kind of summary of our views 
um, regarding uh, the, the next three to five, four years um, and what these challenges and opportunities are. So I will just summarize a little bit that and anyone who wants to deep dive uh, can have a, a look at that, which uh, explains it quite well, I suppose. Um, in the end, what we ask for is, is something we call a, a new digital deal. Um, and we want, of course, the famous human-centric digitization um, as well. Um, uh, I studied the, the Society 5.0 uh, proposal by Japan, um, which was, I think, one of the really forward-looking ones, I have to agree. Um, and I think that, in the end, we all agree that we want sustainable digitization happening. We are in a digital transition of our economies and societies, and we need to steer that actively. Um, everyone wants uh, fairer and, and more inclusive digitization. The question is, of course, you know, um, how do we get there? So the challenges we see, um, I would summarize three. Um, I think that, first of all, the main issue is that we are actually facing quite outdated regulatory frameworks. Um, I mean, let's be honest, uh, today's frameworks have just not been designed for the digital age. Okay? So, I mean, they are clearly outdated. Um, technology is moving very fast and every time faster. Um, we see that um, in the way um, uh, economic growth happens on, on, and digital services grow. I mean, it's uh, totally uh, common that you can see companies uh, and services shooting up from nothing to, to millions of users in, in very short time. Um, it's very difficult, therefore, for policy and regulation to, to keep up with that space, uh, uh, pace, and um, I would fully agree. The bad news is I think that will continue. Um, we will not uh, have kind of time to, to say uh, stop the clock and, and let's slow down. It will not happen. It will continue. Um, just imagine the impact of AI and automatization on, on the work environment. We mentioned that before. Uh, but it's clearly um, um, a huge impact on so many different policies we have designed to support our societies. I mean, just think about social security, uh, pension schemes, um, um, of course, all kind of educational uh, policies we have. Um, to be very honest, I have little children in primary school, and, and I think that in 20 years' time, I, I doubt that I know what kind of jobs they will do and what kind of, um, really, what kind of skills they will need. And I think no one is really discussing that openly um, and, and being honest with people that uh, we will have an environment where machines will be partners of humans, hopefully, um, and where everything which is... Uh, repetitive task will be automized. Um, the industrialization kind of automized our muscles um, and our physical force, and, and now we're going into automizing our brains. I mean, that's simple it is, and that's scary it is, of course, you know? So I think that's something we, we have to be very clear about, that um, these, um, these developments are very fast. Um, I go to these conferences where people come up with these new inventions and everyone goes crazy about it, but I mean, I think it's quite scary when you see that already three, four years ago I saw, you know, that uh, machines can recognize faces better than human beings already. That's today, I mean, it's totally, I mean, the machines are much, much better in recognizing my face than, than my wife. No, I'm, I'm not joking. I mean, that's true. And they will, they will not fail to do that. So the same happens with our voice and so on. So we are already getting into an environment where I think we have to think about this relation uh, much deeper. Um, and I will not get into competition policies and level playing field, as Andres already mentioned that, um, where, we, where we clearly also struggle. Second issue. Um, I think we are doing national solutions for global problems, and, and that's not going to work. Um, I think that um, we heard a lot about the need for cooperation between EU and Japan, and, and that's fantastic, and I think it's a great idea, but of course we need even a bigger uh, cooperation happening. Um, the problem is here that in the end um, we are seeing development going to the other side. Um, I think we're seeing a fragmentation. Um, not only of the internet, because that's something we're used to, and we talked about it in data localization, all these issues we do not like to see, but um, uh, we know that these are uh, known uh, problems. Um, I think we're going now into an area of some unknown problems, and these unknown problems are that we are basically separating the world into technology ecosystems, okay? So I think what happened over the last year um, has kind of destroyed um, the global technology world we've seen up to now. Because, uh, let's be honest, currently if you are a Chinese, you will have an iPhone, you will use a mobile, uh, mobile network built by two Chinese or two European companies. Um, you will have inside that mobile network um, 
chipsets uh, produced by Taiwanese companies based on designs from Denmark um, or the UK, for example, and so on and so forth. So the layer of, of technology below what we do on the social surface, uh, on the application side and so on, where clearly we always have been um, governed by governments and by laws and freedom of speech and all these kind of things we know, and where, for example, you know, I won't mention China. Of course, China has a totally different world than, than we are in. That, that's something we, we know, but I mean, we're going now to a much deeper level. China has just uh, published a strategy that they will replace um, in the public administration all kind of foreign technology over the next five years. So there will be not one computer anymore, it's a Windows system. Okay? That's the world we're in. So we are going into a world where you will kind of separate completely technology, you will have no dependency on any countries. So that's a scary world because honestly, I don't know where Japan is on that or Europe is on that. I mean, everyone hopes that we get autonomy and sovereignty and everyone talks about that, but it's easy talk and it's hard to do because actually we are, we are not even close to that. So I, I guess and I hope that, because I don't believe you can turn back the clock, the confidence is gone and it's gone, I think, for a long time. Um, if you are a Chinese producer now, um, you will know that uh, you are up for a hard fight um, if you want to get into <coughs> Western markets. Um, we know that. And um, so I think that they have learned the, the lesson and they will do something else. Um, they will focus on uh, becoming much more autonomous and they will focus on conquering parts of the world where uh, they will be able to compete. Um, and so we get into this kind of huge technology fight we heard about, okay? So I think that's a, a, very, um, a very unfortunate development, but I think it will happen. Um, and finally, um, to end with, uh, with, a, with a third kind of really big challenge, we see that the whole digitalization is totally asymmetric. Um, we see that, um, and it's asymmetric in various uh, aspects. Um, on a very macro level, you see that some regions are gaining a lot from digitalization and some regions are really losing out. I'm not even saying states, because even inside of countries and states, some regions win and some lose out. Madrid, I think, is winning. Um, some other parts of Spain are losing. In the US, um, Silicon Valley is winning. Some other parts are losing. So this is about um, a lot of, um, uh, uh, richness and, and money flowing to some parts of the world um, and not to others. That's creating huge imbalances and that's always a risk. Second thing, the imbalances happen also on a more kind of micro level, on a, on a personal level. There are people gaining a lot from, um, from these developments and others are totally losing out. Um, and we see that even going into protests like we see in, in France and other countries, um, where some, clearly some people are, are feeling that they're totally disconnected from any uh, economic development currently, and they're not kind of approaching, or they're not, they're not um, getting, their situation not getting better. So I feel that that's uh, very much linked, of course, to uh, technology development, and it's kind of speeding up uh, this process. Um, to, if you want to summarize it, we have many, many um, digital consumers and not a lot of producers. Okay. Uh, the production of digital goods and services is very much concentrated. So, I don't want to depress you, depress you too much. I mean, that's, uh, that's quite a, uh, an honest kind of scenario, and it's not a very nice one, I agree. But I think there are ways forward, and, and I think we mentioned them, and we're very brief on that, so we can have time for questions. But um, I believe that, of course, uh, we have to innovate on how we do policies. Um, it's clear that the... Um, as uh, Makoto said, the, the self-regulation world is gone. Uh, we believe that there needs to be some form of more agile digital governance. That means it will be multi-layered from our point of view. Uh, so you will have self-regulation. Self-regulation is not bad. That's good. I mean, if companies say we want to be good corporate citizens and want to do things well, developing AI, I think that's great, fantastic, and everyone should do that and should be happy. Uh, having said that, it does not mean that there does not need to be any form of supervision, for example, for higher risk use of artificial intelligence. Um, I think that we need a risk-based approach here, and we need to be clear that if you want to put out a system that will decide if I get medical treatment in a hospital in Spain tomorrow, um, I mean, that will be a high risk impact on my life, and I don't want that to be just self-regulated by someone. I want someone to watch into that algorithmic system to see that it's uh, well built. And these are the things we're discussing. We're discussing um, if people get um, out of prison before uh, they have served their, uh, their sentence, and these things are taken uh, already, not taken, but they are su supported by algorithmic decision-making systems, which, by the way, are doing that better than human beings already. 
So I just want to raise a couple of issues, what we're really discussing here, which are really quite impactful in our lives. It's not about uh, having a product um, uh, kind of uh, shown to me on an, on an advertisement shown to me. We're talking about issues that are going to impact um, uh, quite intensively uh, our lives. Um, and it's happening already. Uh, the second thing is, um, I think that we also need to be clear that uh, industrial policies are back um, uh, are back in town. Um, I think they became a little bit outfashioned. Um, I think we're back to that, and it's uh, thanks to China, as someone said before. Um, I think China has a clear industrial strategy, and it's also an, an international industrial strategy. And I think that every, uh, everyone else is kind of uh, now rushing to to come up with something which is similar. Um, and that's difficult for democracies because we are much more short-termist than, um, than, for example, China. So I think that um, we will have to think about how we can become a leader in, in something which is uh, the industrial maybe base of Europe, for example, um, and the, the world of, of the Internet of Things. Um, I think that we have still leading industries, including my industry, telecommunications. Um, I mean, just the other day, there was suddenly this kind of rumor that the US government wanted the US companies to buy European telecommunication manufacturers because that was the only way to be a leader in 5G or 6G. Um, I mean, so we have some, some assets in Europe as well, and Japan has similar, um, uh, similar structures um, where we can still lead um, in some regards. It's not going to be B2C. Okay, let's face it, we're not good in B2C. We're not good in customer-facing uh, services and products, and this world is gone. There's not going to be a European search engine or something like that. Um, but I think there's a lot of things we can do in this manufacturing, IoT, uh, B2, uh, B2B world. Um, and finally, um, international cooperation, and I end with that, um, is going to be very important. It's very um, uh, promising, I have to say, that the European Commission yesterday, uh, when they presented their new strategy for the next four years, I think, um, uh, said clearly that there is one part about international global cooperation on <coughs> digital issues. So they clearly put that out as one priority. I think that Japan has done a great work uh, in, the, in the G20 um, uh, a year ago. Um, but to be very honest, um, I think that also um, we have to improve in the way um, in a similar way as Europe now says, we have to become more influential to be, to be really able to push our value-based uh, view in the world. I think also Japan can become more active, um, and that's a good example of uh, what, what uh, we could do. Um, I can say that, to use another example from my world, um, in the, the last three IGF meetings, the Internet Government meetings of the United Nations has happened in Europe. Um, this year is again Poland. Next year, they're still looking for someone to host it. That's the global internet governance meeting of the world. Um, uh, last time has been in Asia, was in Thailand nearly 10 years ago. Um, I mean, that's a chance for, China, for Japan to come up and raise its hand and become a global player um, and really show that they're committed to a multi-stakeholder system um, of a free and open internet. Um, so I think that these are areas where we could uh, really improve. I think that also business, and that's my final word, will play a key role on that. Uh, it was mentioned before, multi-stakeholder systems are sometimes slow, but they're also good, because very often when politics are in the way of any agreement, multi-stakeholder can work quite well, because it's much uh, less politics and global politics and much more pragmatic policy uh, solution, um, solutions. Um, so basically, um, just to give you another example, um, there is uh, the initiatives in, in cybersecurity where uh, private companies uh, say that they are not going to do certain uh, activities. Uh, one is called Tech Accord, where you have more than 100 security um, IT companies, including Telefonica and, and Microsoft. Um, and we basically have committed ourselves in a self-regulatory way, code of conduct, that we are not going to help governments to attack other governments or other states. Um, so I think that this is not going to prevent a cyber war, but it's going to make it at least more difficult. And I'm watching the UN to come up with a treatment to prevent cyber wars and cyber warfare, uh, which is going to take the next 25 or 30 years, or it will never happen. So um, I think that it's good that at least some of these initiatives go forward, despite the fact that they're not multilateral and signed uh, by the UN. So, um, so with that, I will, I will finish. Okay. Thanks very much. So thank you for packing so many things in so few minutes. Uh, I know we are in the time for the coffee break, but I think we really should take the opportunity of having them here maybe for a couple of short questions. 
So now it's your time. I give the floor to all of you. Anyone who wants to break fire? Too many negative uh, things. We are all uh, very overwhelmed. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much for your uh, conversation. And uh, I'm Gloria from Carlos III. And I would like to ask a question to Professor Makoto Yokozawa. Uh, you have mentioned uh, several sustainable development goals in which I think that Spain and Japan uh, share uh, good strengths like uh, the health and well-being and also uh, in particular, the case of Spain in terms of gender diversity. So I would like to know, or maybe you can further develop more in these areas, which maybe are less different than the technological one, but I, we have kind of a similar competencies. Yes, uh, just, just briefly, I, I would thank you for that. And we need, uh, uh, only the Japanese can do the, all of the things. So we need the partnership. And in this case, and Spain has a very good experience and the ideas, maybe. And I, I have experience to join the open source development here in, in Spain, in, in Caceres, a very small rural city in Spain. So and the, we had a very good discussion in developing the open source. And maybe the, some of the SDGs and in technologically talking about, we can do some of uh, some that uh, not not a GAFA style, but the uh, open source and community uh, concentrated style it would be better than the, the constant. Uh, this, this, in other words, that's the distributed system. So, and the the the, the crowd source crowd crowd system is a concentrated system. So we have uh, many, you know, problems here. So thank you very much, and I, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, maybe another question? It was mentioned by some of the speakers that there are some, also some obstacles for promoting cooperation on the economy between Japan and the EU, but no one did get into the details. So if you just could summarize, maybe, just one or two biggest, you know, obstacles for that, I would appreciate it. I don't know whoever would like to, to react to that, you know. Can I, can I try? Just, just, just brief. Yes, 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 please, please. Um, there's a number of the reasons why uh, EU and Japan has to collaborate. One is the similarity of the culture, and uh, the, uh, the against the China and against the United States. And the secondary, uh, some, uh, you know, the, the difference between the EU and Japan, we have to look into that. So a very good difference, you know. So uh, Japan is uh, specialized in the manufacturing and quality assurance. And we are thinking about the serviceization. And so we are thinking about the new services uh, based on the manufacturing system. So uh, here we need some good idea from the European culture, Euro European uh, expertise. So th this is what I th I'm thinking about. I I'm sorry, and, and this is sorry. sorry. We need to find a good place to collaborate. One is OECD, second WTO, three ITU, and four IGF. Mm -hmm. You have many other opportunities, to, uh, the, the, the places to the collaborate. Yeah, and, and I think if I might just add one thing from, from my sector, uh, I think sometimes I'm, I'm, uh, I'm missing Japanese companies in these international conversations. Um, I think I see a lot of, uh, a lot of Americans um, and Europeans, um, and, and not a lot of Asian in general, but I think Japan could clearly play a bigger role there as well. Um, uh, Makoto feels very lonely sometimes in the OCD, I would say. <laughs> okay, maybe. maybe to add to what has been said, uh, I would emphasize the, the difference in approaches, uh, the philosophical uh, almost, um, where the EU, as we just heard, is, is rather legalistic, um, top-down 
sort of approach, I think, which is central. Uh, and Japan, Japanese have a more of a tendency of, of bottom-up. Um, one example is the human-centered versus human-centric. Um, I think the digital strategy of the EU is human-centric, and uh, the, the, the Japanese Society 5.0 is human-centered. Now, this may seem like you know very unimportant words, but it's actually the way that you put people, um, uh, the, the, the role that people play here, um, is, is, I think, uh, well, a, a difference in approach with the human-centered paying attention to the needs and opinions of the people generally and the human-centric uh, of, of specific groups of people in specific uh, elements. So that's, it, it might, which might seem like minor differences, uh, and, and I think both have come up here and we've used them interchangeably. Um, but actually, if you dig a little one level deeper, you, you see how you know, we come from different angles, and which means that also in the end we aim for different things. So that's why I say you know, we need more strategic and you know, more engagement on each other's thought and discussing all these little things um, in order to understand each other better and then see what can be done in terms of cooperation. Because we have big beasts, uh, like in Japan, the Development Cooperation Agency, you mentioned NEDO, um, and uh, there's of course JBIC, which is the banking style. To get them to cooperate with the European Investment Bank, you know, an MOU is not going to bring you very far, right? <laughs> we have an MOU now, but also there, there has to be an incentive, there have to be concrete projects. So, so a lack of that I see also as an, uh, as an obstacle. Okay, and maybe Andres, a little bit, you made a very good question because everyone wants to add something. No, I would like to add the, the demographic dimension of all this, no? Because I think the Chinese are not looking at Europe and the US. Of course, in, in data issues, uh, persons are very important. The things are going to be much more important. No? Already about 40% of the traffic which goes in, in the mobile system in Spain is between machines, not between people, no? Uh, and I think the Chinese are looking at Africa, at Latin America, and in the end, they don't care too much about you. They, they care in the short run, but not in the long run, and they always have a, a long-term vision, no? And I think that's, those countries are going to have a different approach in terms of uh, uh, values and, and that kind of thing, no? So I guess we will have more questions, but I really believe that coffee, coffee breaks are also important because maybe some people are shy and they don't want to make a question in public, but they may approach the people during the coffee break. So we are going <coughs> to break now until the next panel. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, back uh, now to and um, starting our second session on promoting quality infrastructure to achieve sustainable growth and resilient uh, connectivity. I'm really honored and I thank the Royal Institute uh, Elcano uh, to, to have me participating and chairing this uh, wonderful round table with extremely bright and working minds. Um, in this case, we are probably approaching to a much more pragmatic uh, way of looking into this uh, issue that we are talking today on innovation and connectivity. So, and in order to kind of like make the, the session go much uh, kind of like faster and to have a little bit more of time for Q&A uh, later on, uh, I would like to introduce first the speakers and also we have a little bit of a change in the, in the order of uh, intervention. Uh, so first of all, uh, Mario Esteban uh, will take the, the word. He is an assistant tenure professor at Autonomous University of Madrid. That's uh, where we <laughs> know from each other, a colleague. And he's a senior researcher, at, a senior analyst at uh, El Cano Royal Institute, um, basically focusing on all the subjects and issues from the Asia Pacific area, which means like he has a lot of work. He's always working in many years. Uh, he has a, huge, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, different hats, actually, too to wear as well. And um, after his more macro, probably, way of looking at uh, this issue of the quality infrastructure, we will uh, have uh, Marie Soudeberg, 
who is uh, an honor to, to have her here uh, because her in the academic field and especially from my point of view, from my analysis as well, the relations of European Union and Japan has to pass by some paper work by her. So she's the director of the European Institute of Japanese uh, Studies at the very renowned uh, Swedish School of Economics. Um, she is also, as well, a uh, um, special research fellow at uh, the Osaka University and uh, has been, uh, her research projects have been very much linked of, uh, within the European Union and Japan um, connections, but also on security issues and geopolitical geostrategy in the North uh, East uh, Asia. And she is also chairperson of the um, European uh, Japan Advance uh, Research uh, uh, Network. Uh, the, they will have probably this more academic uh, type of, uh, of vision of this subject, but we will pass on to much more pragmatic, much more corporate uh, way of looking at it. And joining uh, me for this uh, second part of the round table are the examples of two um, incredible infrastructure um, consultant firms uh, that have probably the, sustainable, the sustainability as a brand name in their way of, of approaching their engineering projects. Um, let me introduce first Agustin Science because this is where we are changing a little bit the order of interventions. Uh, Agustin Science, uh, he is uh, an engineering, uh, but I think he's a global Basque. <laughs> <laughs> Has been basically around the world an incredible um, academic uh, uh, with academic background. He has earned a master at the Harvard University Institute for Strategy and um, Competitiveness, then an MBA from Delfto, special innovation courses at Esade Business School, so she has really been on the leading uh, academic world. And uh, for many years he was uh, uh, working at uh, Fatronic the Research Center, which later was uh, um, joined no, by, with uh, Technalia, which is uh, uh, where he is now as, uh, working as VP Markets. And talking to him, he actually has a much more kind of positive, trusting people, human side uh, to this uh, framework that we've been listening to in the, in the previous session. So let's try to put like the case study as something more positive and uh, sunnier uh, and brighter for the future. And. Um, Lastly, but uh, not less important, is, and I'm really honored to, to have here uh, Mrs. Um, Ae uh, Reiko Abe. And uh, the ambassador Hiramatsu has already introduced her uh, quite, uh, uh, quite uh, extensively. Uh, she is president of Oriental Consultants in India. And I have uh, to say that Oriental Consultants uh, Global Corporation, the, the mother corporation, is uh, one of these uh, incredible innovative consultant firms in, in Japan um, that has uh, projects of infrastructure, of urban planning that range from Nicaragua, Macedonia, um, Qatar. In fact, I think you've been involved in the Qatar urban planning uh, of, uh, uh, before like going to, to India. She is a civil engineer um, in the corporate world, which were for a woman, I think, and in Japan is really, really difficult. Uh, she has probably faced many limitations and not thinking those are limitations, but just simple challenges that you can <laughs> go over with, uh, um, overcome. And uh, after that uh, part of experience, went to uh, Norway, and congrats to the Norway uh, University of uh, Science and Technology to earn her PhD, and uh, involved in the in the building of uh, some infrastructures in Norway. Then went back to Taiwan uh, for the ballet train and been as well in the Qatar uh, planning until she has reached uh, this. Uh, uh, Indian uh, huge project of the construction of the Delhi Metro and now like expanding to Ahmedabad and to other uh, cities which we we'll see will bring some examples of. So this is my <laughs> turn and I just give the floor to Maria Esteban to start with the session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ana Maria, for the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk basically about three different things in 10 minutes. First, I'm going to try to explain why connectivity matters, because we are here today talking about connectivity, so I think it's important to introduce you know, the relevance of the topic. Then I will try to, to present how uh, or what 
has triggered uh, EU-Japan cooperation on connectivity. And finally, I will talk a little bit about the implications of that cooperation for a multilateral and rule-based approach towards connectivity. You know, and particularly, I'm going to link that with how the EU and Japan try to relate with China when it comes to this particular topic. Actually, I'm going to talk a lot about China you know, in, my, in my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so first, uh, relevance of connectivity. I think it's, it's very obvious for many of you that in the last decade, this uh, word has reemerged as a catchword in foreign affairs. Um, and the reason is threefold. I mean, I think there are like three factors explaining the relevance of this, of this concept. And these factors are interlinked you know, among them. First, uh, this is a driver for socioeconomic growth. We tend to forget that many countries are putting relevance on this issue because they hope to break some of the bottlenecks that hinder their economic development. When we talk about connectivity, one very relevant dimension is infrastructure on key economic sectors like energy, transportation, telecommunications, you know, and so on. And they're very developing countries. That they are aware that if they want you know, to, to, to move up, if they want to uh, increase the welfare of their people, they really need to uh, improve their infrastructure on those areas. So in the domestic agenda of many particularly developing countries, this is a high relevant issue. Uh, but of course, you know, the countries that cooperate with those other countries that are expecting to improve their infrastructures, they do so for different reasons. They do so uh, because they try also to promote their economic interests. They also do so because they try to increase their diplomatic presence on those countries. And also that's the reason that many players, you know, many relevant powers, they are leading their own connectivity initiatives. Because of course, when you lead a connectivity initiative, you, know, you are in a better position to increase your presence in third countries. But this is not just the third reason, it's because this is not just about promoting business, this is not just about promoting diplomatic uh, relations. It also has uh, very salient strategic implications. Some of them have been mentioned, of course, in the previous, in the previous panel. You know? Because when different players promote different uh, connectivity initiatives, they promote different norms, different standards. And when we talk, for example, about the control of critical infrastructures, because of course some of the sectors I mentioned before, you know, they have like a key strategic relevance, uh, this has security implications. It's very obvious when we talk, it was mentioned also 5G, cyber security, you know. <clears throat> so this is not just about socioeconomic development, this is not just about promoting economic or diplomatic interest, this is also about uh, your strategy, this is also about security, and even some people argue that about defense, because you know the control mm -hmm. of some a particular infrastructure, like for example ports and so on, may in favor you know, the promotion, let's say for example, of uh, military diplomacy, but I, I'm not really moving into that. So uh, I think it's very obvious you know, that, that connectivity is quite relevant, uh, nowadays, and that's the reason we are here talking about, <laughs> about that, that topic. Actually, I would like to, to quote you know, the EU ambassador uh, for connectivity, Romana Blahutin, you know, when she said that um, if the EU, but of course this also applies to Japan, you know, we want to remain being international actors instead of becoming playgrounds, you know, we really need you know, uh, to develop our own connectivity strategies. Uh, but when we look at what has triggered this uh, growing interest in connectivity in Europe and Japan, and also this bilateral cooperation okay, on the field, we have to recognize that we have been reactive. We haven't been proactive. That was also mentioned before. That's, that's the truth. It's fine, we can say it. Okay? <laughs> it was the Bell and Road Initiative that, of course, you know both Japan and the EU, they have previous initiatives on connectivity. Okay, let's be clear also on that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's quite obvious that the amount of interest, resources, you know, that we are putting now into this field has a lot to do with a reaction of the Bell and Road Initiative. It's been a, a reactive movement. Uh, why? Because, as we said before, connectivity is so relevant. And when you see, you know, like um, a country like China, you compete with China, of, you know that this paper, quite uh, famous paper of the European Commission, you know, uh, giving these three roles to China for the EU perspective, you know, like 
uh, economic like partner, economic competitor, and systemic rival, okay? It's quite obvious that when you see this dimension of economic competitor, and even more, this dimension of systemic rival, and you see how China is using this massive connectivity initiative to promote their interest in those fields, well, and not just far away from home, you know, even inside the EU, you know, neighboring regions, like the Balkans, and also for Japan, it's very obvious in Southeast Asia, which is a key part of the world for Japanese, you know, uh, interest. Uh, well, you feel that it's in your interest to react to that. Um, this reaction, you know, I feel is, is, uh, it has a lot to do, not just about, let's say, uh, realist interest, but it also has a lot to do with a normative dimension. Because even if we recognize, and, and actually, you know, I think that the EU and Japan, they do recognize, there are many declarations by Japanese and EU authorities recognizing that, that this Grand Road Initiative has a huge developmental potential. This is there, I mean, it's very obvious. If you go to like Sri Lanka or Pakistan or many African countries, even if they have problems on the ground, they also see, you know, this. Uh, promising part, but as I say, you have these two sides, and one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that this developmental potential is not being implemented, they are the normative ways in which the Bell and Road Initiative is being implemented. You know, problems have to do with lack of transparency, therefore lack of accountability, lack of uh, social, environmental, climate, even financial sustainability. You know, and it was mentioned before, you know, one paper we, we brought together, you know, my colleague Ugo Armanini, who is there, and, and myself, you know, we wrote a, a paper on this. Um, we present a lot of data, a lot of examples, you know, I can give you a few later, maybe if you're interested, because I don't want really to, 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 to speak for too long, but there are plenty of examples of these problems. We know of that, uh, people on the ground know about that, and therefore I think it's, it's been a very clever way, you know, for the EU and Japan, to promote or to emphasize, to underline this normative dimension. Because we, we need to set like higher standards, you know, that we contribute to this developmental dimension that I mentioned before. Because that developmental dimension is also very relevant for bringing stability, you know, for so many countries and a stable, you know, uh, international context is of course in the interest of the EU and Japan, you know, being such an open eco economies, open societies, you know, that we depend so much, you know, on international trade and investment, you know, and, and so on. Okay? Um, so in that, from that part, you know, um, I think that uh, also the, the third point that I wanted to, to underline, I think it's very relevant because even if this um, EU-Japan partnership on sustainable uh, connectivity, you know, and quality infrastructure, even if it's a reactive movement, it shouldn't be understood as an um, excluding uh, movement via via China. You know, it was mentioned also before this idea that mm -hmm. Japan, and look at China as a country you have to engage even when you don't endorse what they do. Mm -hmm. And this is the same on connectivity. You know, I think that the key point is putting on the table higher standards, and if China is willing to work along those standards, you're open for cooperation with China. You know? But the idea is that if, if uh, the EU and Japan are able to make those higher standards work on the ground, because that's one of the key points was mentioned also before, we need projects. Okay? We, standards are important, but those standards, if they are not implemented on a specific projects, we are not gonna get much traction. We are not gonna get much attention of those other countries, you know, we mentioned before, and we are not going to influence China on that because China, of course, if they don't feel the, the pressure for changing their normative dimension, they are not gonna do it. They're, by themselves, they feel very comfortable dealing with those countries in a bilateral level, in a non-transparent way, you know, they feel comfortable by themselves doing that. But if we are able to make work, put into action, you know, a different and a better, way of promoting connectivity, of course, you know, China will feel, you know, more pressure in order to, to change some of those uh, ways, you know, of, of implementing connectivity with their, with their countries. Um, and this is a key point also because, as you know, and that's my, my last idea, you know, that uh, this cooperation between the EU and Japan, you know, is, is key for, like, promoting this uh, multilateral and rules-based, you know, international order, which is being eroded obviously from Beijing, but also from Washington. You know, this is also very obvious, particularly well, both 
both sides, the multilateral and the rules-based. You know? The current administration is very obvious doing that in many areas. So um, if you know, we are able to make this work in a multilateral level you know, with countries, with the US, would be relatively easier you know, than with, with China. But if all, also we are able to, to include China, I would think that really would make a real difference. You know, will really reduce the strategic competition. And what uh, Christoph mentioned before, for example, when it comes to this technological um, field, you know, that has been divided into two parts. You know, uh, this could be a way. You know, trying to set some bridges. I know that the. I mean, we just published actually a report. You know, on, on this. You know, the European level here at Elcano with other European think tanks. Um, and we know of the enormous difficulties that uh, Japan and the EU you know, face these days when it comes to trying to promote multilateral initiatives, because that's not the mood, neither in Washington or, or, or Beijing. You know? And of course, you know, we, we need also to, to recognize our own limitations. But at the same time, we need to be a little bit, I think, more um, aware of our own strength. You know, and, and I think that's also part of the problem, you know, for the EU. For a long time, when it comes to this issue of connectivity, for a long time, we thought that we didn't have enough capacity or an, uh, something, you know, like to offer or to put on the table. And I think that fortunately, in the, quite recently actually, but at least, you know, I think that finally this has changed. And now we are more willing, you know, to, to, to actually, you know, have a strategy and devote resources to this. And I hope, you know, that this will be like the, um, the trend, you know, in the future, but of course this is, something that we will have to, to watch because we don't know yet. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. Is this one on? Yes. yes, it is. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to El Cato Institute and this conference. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, very happy to discuss EU-Japan cooperation, which is one of my main fields. <laughs> uh, I want to get back to the Belt and Road immediately and uh, this huge project. Uh, where did the Chinese get the idea from? I think this is actually what Japan... Of course, there are different countries and it's not the same when you are a, a state-led economy like in China. But what did Japan do when it comes to cooperation in Southeast Asia from the 1980s, 1990s and on to now? Building infrastructure, connectivity, economic zones, power plants and so forth by use of development cooperation money and even to China. China was one of the biggest recipients of Japanese development corporations in the 1980s. So um, this is a field which actually Japan knows very well, much better than us Europeans, who has been on, I would say, very high chairs uh, with our development corporations, who uh, has been, especially from the Nordic countries, I'm from Stockholm <laughs> myself, where we have uh, promoted norms, which is, of course, very important to promote and where we have uh, been looking for sustainability uh, all the time and uh, being transparent and everything. But um, you also have to look at the, development, the developing world. What are they looking for? I think uh, uh, pushing norms to do that, you have to also bring concrete projects if there's going to be any effect of what you're doing. And we have been, I think, all European countries actually within DAC, the Development Association Committee of the OECD, we have been for many years actually criticizing Japan for being the odd man out and being too close between uh, development cooperation and private industry. And now when we have moved into the sustainable development goals since a few years back and we are working on a much broader level, the old European pattern of development cooperation has actually become obsolete. And what are the countries doing today? We are all looking for getting more private 
cooperation involved in developing countries outside the industrialized countries. So we are actually going in the way that Japan has been going all the time. So this is a news, I think, um, very much in the forefront for Japan. So uh, what can we expect? What can Europe contribute to? And why would Japan want to cooperate with Europe? I, then we're getting back to China again. And uh, <laughs> they feel that they need more cooperation partners. But because we're also small if we compare with China. And uh, the same with the Chinese development banks. Japan never joined the uh, AIIB. Uh, many European countries did. We said we want to be there so that we can have a look and see what they're really doing. So we joined. Um, but this is just a small bank compared with other Chinese banks. It's a huge bank if you compare with the World Bank or the European Bank for uh, reconstruction and, or the European Investment Bank. But the Chinese are so much huger in, in scale, so we need to cooperate. And I think that project-based things are very important if we want to move the agenda forward. And now we actually have, of course, the US is another factor and the Trump policy of America first. We realized uh, that we need to shape up. <laughs> and maybe cooperate with Japan in a number of fields if we want to protect uh, the liberal world order, which it's, I think the big players doing this today. That's EU and Japan. And uh, we need to cooperate if we want to still keep it. The stra besides the economic partnership agreement, of course, the strategic partnership agreement that we concluded and which is being implemented since last year, was uh, very important because now we have a legal framework for cooperation, now exists. <laughs> and also EU and Japan has done, uh, put together a joint committee, which had its first meeting in 2019 in Tokyo. And they are supposed to pinpoint the areas where we are to cooperate in the future. In March last year, they had security, which we did not talk much about here, but this is also the Japanese, I think also European to a certain extent, if we talk about the European Union, broader perspective of security, not only military security, but also connectivity, digital security, food security, environment, and sustainability. So security, climate change, nuclear disarmament. This is also a very important field where EU and Japan could and should cooperate. And infrastructure development as well as development cooperation. That's priority areas. And actually development cooperation can be a strong tool for implementing cooperation in all those areas, I would say. It is a field in which both Japan and EU feel comfortable. EU has been putting up more than 50% of all development cooperation in the world. And Japan is also a big player here. And what more, it's likely to be appreciated by developing countries. And so how do I connect this with uh, then con uh, connectivity and infrastructure development? Uh, I think that's, that's uh, obvious. Um, if you're going to build like infrastructure together, EU and Japan, point out a few projects and build them together, you need the financing. And if you are in developing countries, then I don't expect that we should pay for the complete roads or power plants or whatever, but we need clever financing a good way of making the projects viable for the people in those countries. Um, and, of course, we can also act as a role model for transparent procurement practices, the ensuring of debt sustainability. I mean, uh, the developing countries paid off a lot of debts a few decades ago, and we do not want to do that again. 
by debts incurred by Chinese projects. So this, and also social and environmental sustainability is of course very important for us. Um, it's also, as you were into, it's a way a push within EU to transform EU from a payer to a player. And that's really one of the fields where we could do it in development cooperation and maybe working together with Japan. It also suits Japanese uh, politics. Japan, uh, now the development cooperation for Japan should be proactive cooperation to peace. That's written in the development cooperation charter in, in Japan. And this stipulates actually strategic utilization of ODA. And I think strategic is a very important uh, world, word because uh, we have to be very strategic when we are in the world like it, well, like it looks today and where we have a big player like China and another one like the US who has the America first policy at the moment, although we don't know how long that will last. Lost. Uh, so it, it is important to be very strategic, I think. And so far, EU-Japan uh, cooperation, uh, we had a long overview this morning of how it went from the Hague Agreement to the action plan and how we, it's been a lot of talking, but very, very little action so far. Uh, so, if I would suggest something on how to move forward, I think this joint committee that will be meeting in Tokyo every year and put up what's next on the implementation of the strategic partnership agreement, they should put up a number of subcommittees, and maybe specifically in the field of development, which we could use in third world countries, or in multilateral organizations. And these subcommittees, they should consist of government officials, of course, uh, but also practitioners dealing with development cooperation, representatives from private business, civil society, and scholars from both developed and developing countries. It's very important to also not forget that developing countries, we should ask what are they looking for, what are their needs, not only direct from above. And these subcommittees uh, should be assigned limited areas in which they could come up with specific suggestions for development cooperation projects. And uh, some of these projects, of course not all, should be chosen chosen for implementation. And then EU and Japan should go together and implement a few projects together and advertise them heavily, tell everyone what we're doing so that it would be known that EU and Japan are also in this field and we are doing this and this with connectivity or with data flows and assisting other countries this way and it's transparent and so forth and if we do infrastructure projects the norms will come with them I think. Um, the world is changing, we heard that last session at a rapid pace and development cooperation uh, need to change with that if we want it to stay relevant if we don't only want to disappear from the stage, leaving it to the US and China alone. And my belief is that Japan and EU, we have the knowledge, education, experience, as well as economic resources to play center stage in this process of connectivity, if we use our power cleverly. Maybe I end here and yes. Thank you very much. we can continue in the question and answer Thank session. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'm afraid that my perspective is it's, it's in a different, in a different layer. You know that uh, 
The, uh, first of all, when I was invited to come here, it was well, that was my absolutely pleasure. Uh, uh, but I have a, a doubt with the, even, even with the, the title of the of the uh, workshop. I mean, innovation and connectivity. And in, in my case, innovation and connectivity should, should finish uh, uh, the sentence with forgive the redundancy. <laughs> because, uh, uh, I mean, probably, well, from, from my point of view, there's no, there's no innovation without, connecti without connectivity. And probably there's no connectivity without innovation nowadays. I mean, that if, if we go to go ahead into the new projects, into the new collaboration, I mean, that the, we, we need to introduce the innovation all over the, the, the task, all over the issues. And, and probably when, when you are working, which is my case, in, in, a, in a Randy Center, in a research and technological center, uh, well, innovation and connectivity, it, it's absolutely connected. I mean, that we, we, we cannot uh, perform any, any project without connect, connectivity, without connections, without partners, without uh, other people which is uh, adding other capabilities, complementary capabilities. And, and more and more, uh, this, is, this is absolutely impossible to do it uh, Locally, I mean that it, it's absolutely connected. No, I mean that the hybridation, the, the the mixture of technologies, sectors, countries, different culture, different people. We are we are in Technalia, uh, uh, 1,500 people, uh, only only producing R&D projects all around the world. We have 35 different nationalities. When I was started more than 25 years ago, I mean that we, we only have one, okay? <laughs> we only one nationality, one place, uh, uh, 10 customers. Now absolutely, well, the, the, the world is, fl is flat, that's, that's absolutely sure. I mean, we're, we're absolutely connected. So uh, from my point of view, uh, Ana Maria was explaining that, I was discussing that connectivity and innovation, it's really, really related with people. I mean, it's really related with, with human beings, with, with interaction between pairs of people. And, and when I'm talking, uh, um, take a look to the, to the projects that we have with Japan, but with other countries, with other uh, regions, and which, which are the success uh, projects and which, are, which is more important, the failed projects. We, we have also to take a look to the failed projects, which was the reason for that fail. Always, always, I mean, 100% of cases, it's related with people connectivity. So we have extremely good results, extremely good projects, extremely good success in Japan, and extremely good failures in Japan. And we have the same regulation, the same standardization barriers, the same, the same different culture. Uh, so my perspective is that that connectivity uh, has a lot of layers. And sometimes when we are talking about the macroeconomy or this kind of, of, of uh, ecosystem analysis, it's true that it's plenty of barriers of different uh, uh, perspectives. But if you fall down and you go deeper and deeper and deeper, at the end, it's a relationship between two companies or even more, between two people, two group of people, two teams, uh, two teams which are working together. And, and my experience is that we have extremely good results in Japan with one robotics company, with one automotive company here, producing a product for China, extremely good experience, working really soft, no problem at all. And we have extremely good failures with robotics Japanese company, automotive European company, producing a product for China. So under the macro point of view, well, it, it should be the same. But at the end, one of them is producing millions of, of, of euros of benefit and the other one, it's producing millions of headaches and, and nights <laughs> with, with, with problems. So I, I think that uh, if I take a look to the, which are the, 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 the key success, or, uh, or the key for success, or the, or the key for, for failures, uh, I could summarize in, in four, in four uh, issues. First one is that we need to share a vision with the other company. I mean, that I'm talking about between company and company. I mean, that is not country to country. And my experience is not related with projects between countries or between regions. It's more related with projects between companies. So, uh, which is, which is, it's different. It's plenty of different uh, issues which are different. It's not the same country to country than company to company. So my feeling is that the first one is that we have to share a vision. Sometimes you, you take a look to a company and you, you think that it could be a customer or it could be a provider, or it could be 
uh, partner. But at the end, the first movement is, okay, let's share the vision, which is the vision that you have, which is the vision that we have. And a vision is not a really long term, 15 years. It is a vision to two, three years. But okay, which, which is your vision of that product, of that technology, or of that relationship in three years? Because if we don't share that, probably it's, it's failure for sure. Uh, but if, if we share that, okay, it's the first establishment. <coughs> Second one is really important for me. Uh, uh, if I take a look to do the examples, uh, to the projects, we have, actually we will have around 15 running projects, more than 10 million euros in, in projects uh, in cooperation with Japanese companies and European companies, Spanish, Spanish ones, especially in robotics, uh, advanced robotics. Uh, and the second, the second issue is really critical, which is let's share the values. I mean, that the values in terms of which is the value of that company, which is the value of that team, which are the values of that team. For example, in our case, uh, uh, well, the first meetings with, with companies there, I I'm, I'm show a, a, a picture, I, I show a, a PowerPoint in, in which I include that our, our values are, well, technology but with business perspective first. So for us, technology is a tool. So this is, it could be sound, well, obvious, but when you, when, we are, when you are talking, for example, with a university, with the University of Tsukuba, that we have extremely good relationships with, with the University of Tokyo, well, sometimes research is not a tool, it's the end. I mean, okay, we are developing that, that technology, we are researching in that technology, and okay, that's the end. In our case, that's the, that's the beginning. Okay, we have the technology, and let, let, let's find out which is the business that we are going to produce with that technology. So if we don't share that value, um, it's, it's not easy. O other value that we have is, uh, let's take a look to this one, no? is efficient creativity. It's not creativity, because creativity, it's okay, but efficient creativity, which means that, okay, it has to be really efficient in certain times, in, in terms of, of, of the issues that you are going to achieve, in, in terms of, 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 of the KPIs that you have to produce during the, during the research activity, during the project activity. So that, that, that uh, it's also important. And the third and fourth is flexibility and connectivity. So flexibility means that, okay, we have to be really flexible, otherwise it, it, will, it will not run. Uh, so flexibility is absolutely a value. And flexibility, in Japan, my experience is that sometimes, uh, depending on the company, well, it's not, not the same uh, meaning that we have. Uh, so we have, to, we have to overlap our meaning of flexibility with the meaning of the flexibility of that company. And sometimes they consider that they are, one company is absolutely flexible, but for us it's not flexible at all. <laughs> so if, if you don't match that, uh, it's, really, it's really a problem. So second, it's values. Third one is, okay, we have to analyze really well the technologies, the core technologies that we want to tackle. I mean, that, which are exactly the technologies that we want to share with that company. Because uh, there are some technologies that, well, uh, I mean, that it, it, well, there's no opportunities now. Uh, but on the other hand, there's other opportunities that it's extremely connected connected between the Japanese companies, some of the Japanese companies, and some of the European companies. So, and we have to find out. It, the, it, there's no a list, there's no any book, there's no any publication in which are the technologies which are connected between the automotive companies here in, in Spain and the Japanese companies in automotive. There's no, there's no a list of, that, of those connections. It's a list, there's a list of technologies, there's a list of companies, but it's not so easy to, to find out that that matrix of connections between companies and technologies. And sometimes uh, it's, it's also a research, a different research, but how, how to find out that connections is really critical. So my perspective is that when we have found out some, for example, uh, robotics companies which are working in Japan in some technologies, but it's not really connected with the needs that we have here in Europe. And on the other, in the other cases, it's absolutely connected. So we have to find out that. that we need a... a a pre-analysis of, of which are that, that technologies that are, are connected with the needs here. In our case, uh, we have two groups of technologies now running uh, with Japan. So one group is, is related with people-centric, I mean that everything related with uh, people-centric technologies, uh, hyper-automation, multi-experience of, of, for the people, democratization of technology, but 
more and more human augmentation. I mean that more and more the human augmentation technologies are plenty of opportunities, plenty of common business between both between both worlds, and and this this is a lot of this is a, an opportunity for for developing a lot of projects. And the other group is smart spaces. I mean that everything related with how to produce that smartness in in, in different things, no? and, and empowered age, autonomous things, uh, AI, but not AI, AI security. I mean that, that that's a topic that which is really uh, interested from both from both sides or. or Practical blockchain, it's not blockchain, it's practical blockchain. I mean that, okay, so concrete projects, concrete products, concrete new businesses based on blockchain, for example, for industry. We have a, a, an extremely good uh, uh, example playing with Airbus, the airplane manufacturer here in, in Spain and Toulouse in France, with FANOC, uh, with their uh, robotics uh, company in, in Japan, and with us working in how to use blockchain for the traceability of the security of drones inside factories. Okay, so it's a combination of drones, blockchain as a, as a traceability, uh, well, technology able for sure in some, some security, and not in the, in the open space, but inside the factories. Okay, so that's, and well, I remember probably 15 years ago, 12 years ago, it was the first time that I, I invited some, some uh, colleagues in, in, from Japan, from FANOC, uh, coming here to, to south of Spain, in Andalusia, to some of the plants of Airbus. There was no one, there was no uh, one uh, yellow robot. You see the FANOC, the, the FANOC robots are always yellow. So you, you can identify really fast if, if there is one or not. It was no, around Europe, one, one yellow robot from FANOC. Now it's the it's the main the main uh, provider of robots for for Airbus in in Europe and it, it, the first the first contact between Fanuc and, and and Airbus was in a visit that was organized by us in in Andalusia in the south in in Cadiz and in, in, in Sevilla. So I think that it's plenty of opportunities. It's true that it's plenty of barriers. I mean that the standardization. Uh, the different uh, taxes, different cultures, but at the end you can find niches of, of opportunities based based on people. And the fourth one uh, is again in that it, it has to be people-based relationship. It has to be people-based relationship. I have a I have a slide that usually I, I, I use in my presentation that it's don't don't look for contacts, look for friends. I mean, if you go to, to a fair, if you go to, a, to a, a meeting with a company and you are looking for, I mean, business cards of contacts, probably it doesn't run. If you go there looking for friends, probably at, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, you will have a couple of them that in the near future it could be friends. And well, I, I'm, really trust, I'm really trust people. I mean, that, so I think that most, most of our, mm, interesting projects are based on, well, probably it's innocent, positive, I don't know. But it's based on, f on friendship. I mean, I have really good friends in Tokyo. I used to go there two or three times a year, and I don't feel that I go for making business. Obviously, I go for making business. But, well, I go for sharing experiences, for sharing opportunities, for sharing uh, niches of, of, of opportunities. When there is a problem, always there is a there is a there is a, a, a well a, a possibility of, of doing something new, and this is also interesting. And finish with that, with China. I, I'm, I'm during this morning. I have been uh, different perspectives of China. Uh, I'm also really involved in, in a lot of uh, international advisory committees there in China. Uh, I think that most of times it's not a war. It's not with China or without China. Most of times, it's, it's a kind of competition. Sometimes we cooperate, other, other times we, we compete. So there's a competition. And, and, and China is, is really big. Is, well, you can find the, everything. And, and my experience now more and more is that when I, I, I'm in Shanghai, with the startup young people, well, that, that's, that's a completely different China than the big company that really politics uh, uh, affected. 
I mean, that the, the, the ecosystem of, of young people there producing new technologies, and we have extremely good relationships and projects between Japanese companies, European companies, and new startup uh, Chinese companies, really fast-growing companies, fast-growing products. So I think that we, we, should, we should look at China also. Okay, there are some barriers, there are some limits, there are some red lines, but also it, it's, pl it's plenty of, of, of opportunities. Uh, and it's not the same. I have relationships with, with the national train manufacturer, or Chinese train manufacturer, which is a huge company. Uh, and well, this is China, but I have also extremely good relationships with the startups in, in Shanghai. And well, it's two worlds, two worlds, completely different worlds. And probably with one of them, it's really difficult to make business. It's not win-win relationship. It's all win. It's always win, win, win with that size of the letter, and win with that size of the letter. This is a win, win. Well, yeah, but win, win. No? Mm. I mean that in that in that case. But when when we are talking to the startup ecosystem, it's completely different. So I think that we should look at China and Japan, plenty of opportunities also. Well, I think it's. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, thank yes. you very much. Yes, uh, my name is Abe. Thank you for the invite of the, invite me uh, regarding that, uh, this uh, uh, seminar. I'm first man, uh, tunnel engineer in Japan, but I couldn't work at the construction site in Japan because why? That's all. In Japan, there is a, a very strange custom that the Japanese mountain goat is female goat. So if a uh, woman enter to the tunnel during the, the construction, yes, female goat has jealousy to woman. Finally, the uh, mountain will collapse. So they believe so, they say so. So I couldn't enter to the, the construction site. So I left from Japan. And uh, that, uh, I worked for that, uh, Norwegian's, uh, Norwegian's construction site. Uh, Norwegian, uh, so uh, that I uh, accumulated that, uh, my tunnel uh, construction experience in Norway because Norwegian's mountain not reject me. <laughs> After the Norway, I worked for the uh, uh, Taiwan High Speed Railways tunnel project and uh, Abundant uh, chemical weapons uh, treatment project in China, and Qatar project, and uh, Kiev metro in Ukraine. And after that, yes, I shift to the uh, Indians project, Indians metro project. Now, that, uh, I worked for the uh, uh, daily metro project for three years, and Bangalore metro's project for three years, and Ahmedabad metro project for three years. And now uh, I'm working for the uh, Indian high-speed railways project with Japanese and Rome. And in India, the 10 number metros, including the daily metro, are already uh, operating. And uh, approximately 50, five zeros numbers metros project are under the uh, planning and studying now. So, so many projects is that are ongoing and under that uh, planning and also that are studying. So there is so many chance uh, in the India for construction field. But not only that are uh, such a huge number of the project, but also that are significant that are uh, operating that uh, metro's line. So uh, daily metro already that are operating over the 500, uh, 400 kilometer lengths. The Tokyo Metro has only the 300 kilometer lengths. So it means that the daily metro already exceeds of the Tokyo Metro. So uh, daily metro's person said, we already exceed the Tokyo Metro. Yes, I'm so much angry to, to them. <laughs> But yes, our daily metro already, uh, started that, uh, uh, such a construction work uh, from that, uh, 1998. So during that uh, 20 years, they exceed of the uh, Tokyo Metro. 
That is that's a huge, uh, very amazing. And, uh, and Indians engineer uh, that uh, uh, want to learn that uh, new technology. They like that uh, new. But uh, that, uh, regarding that uh, quality and safety management, they did not pay attention. They doesn't like that uh, run of that, uh, such a management, especially quality and safety. Because quality and safety, uh, that, uh, it's not so, uh, uh, there is uh, no shown uh, to the public immediately. New technology, they can show that uh, this is a new technology, this is a new technology. But there's uh, a management, it's not so that are uh, so clear to the public. So they didn't pay attention of that uh, safety management and quality management. So uh, that I also that so much uh, so much uh, uh, frustration regarding that uh, to instruct uh, them that are regarding that quality and safety. And that are at present, yes, uh, 1.8 million passenger use of that daily metro. 1.8 million already. And uh, that, uh, so daily metro is at uh, one of the success project uh, with that uh, Japanese and loan. Uh, this metro is that, uh, is not only that uh, such a uh, passengers. Uh, that uh, this metro is fast transportation uh, with good security for women. Because there's a, maybe you know that in India there is a so, a so rape or something in that a, a bus and in that a, a, some of that a, a public transportation. But only that the metro that a, is that a, a good security. So, so many uh, women use of that metro because of the security. So, uh, that, uh, this daily metro provided to that opportunity, uh, job opportunity to the uh, women. Uh, for instance, in my, uh, in my office, that uh, uh, first uh, 20 years ago, that uh, uh, only that, uh, one woman. But at this moment, half of that uh, employee is woman because they can use of that metro. So they can uh, come to that, uh, our office by metro. And previously, their parents uh, that, uh, reject to uh, go to that uh, downtown because of that, uh, <laughs> such a security. But at this moment, that the parents agree to go to, uh, to enter to that, uh, such a, uh, any, uh, any place of the uh, office. That is a uh, significant change to provide that opportunity, uh, job opportunity to women. And uh, at first, yes, uh, Indian client of the metro uh, has no experience because yes, 99% uh, uh, of that uh, engineer doesn't know that the metro and not uh, not ride on that metro. So that uh, uh, to our consultant company uh, provided that uh, consulting service uh, instead of that uh, client, and we hire with that uh, four, uh, approximately 400 engineer uh, for the one project. And for instance, yes, sir, uh, at Ahmedabad Metro. That uh, consulting group is that uh, conducting that uh, uh, Sistora France and uh, Light India and uh, Acom America and uh, my company Japan. So we just go conduct of that uh, such a uh, such a joint venture, uh, European and uh, America and India and Japan. And for instance, yes, uh, Lucknow Metro in India. That's a uh, 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 Spanish company. That's uh, Aisha and the Indian's company, and also the, our company. We already have that, such a joint venture. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, that, uh, uh, I'm showing that uh, some of the picture uh, that, uh, at the uh, Indian's metals construction, uh, construction site, regarding the uh, quality and safety management. It is uh, easy for understanding what's happened at the construction site.
in India, the uh, traffic jam, not because of the car, uh, but also that the cow, <laughs> like this one. <laughs> so you can see of that uh, this one, that the uh, crane falling down. So that, uh, uh, this is that on the Sunday's afternoon, uh, that the one engineer called me, Madam, that uh, uh, crane falling down, please come. And I just uh, go to the construction site. And this person is a green helmet, the person is a safety, chief safety engineer. He said, Madam, no problem. <laughs> it's a no problem, I'm not here. And this one is that during the midnight, they broken of the water pipeline. So that the road is uh, like this one, allocation. And uh, midnight, yes, one engineer, one uh, construction manager, called me, Madam, road disappear, no problem. <laughs> and you can see that uh, this is uh, my business card. My name is Abe, as same as our yes. prime minister. So you can see that uh, what's wrong? What yeah. <laughs> my name is ABC. So of course, yes, I complained to the uh, printing company but printing company said, Madam, A and B, next is C. You are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, I have to say to that our prime minister, you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a, some of the big carbon uh, on, the, on the wall. So I, of course, yes, are uh, uh, getting angry. And to, that, uh, to say to that uh, construction company, uh, please issue that uh, non-conformance report. So they issue that uh, non-conformance report. Non-conformance report, including that uh, corrective action and preventive action. Non-conformance report, Construct, uh, corrective action. I will do it. I will do it. Preventive action, believe me. <laughs> this is that uh, uh, I got that, uh, this report from them. So you understand that uh, what's happening in the India? Yes, uh, we have to instruct that uh, like this condition. That uh, from beginning, they didn't know that uh, what what meaning of the uh, non-conformance report, what meaning of the safety, what meaning of the uh, quality. We just training and training, training again, because yes, uh, uh, in India that uh, 40,000 uh, worker is working at the construction site. So we have to uh, instruct to them. Thank you very much, and safety first. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much for all the speakers. They have kept basically in, on, on time, so we do have at least like full almost 20 minutes, no? To, well, 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A session. So I'll give you now the floor if you want to ask questions, either from the very um, state more uh, policy uh, view or to the more people-to-people, uh, -people actually, <laughs> uh, business vision. Anyone? Yes, please. Thank you very much for a really interesting and inspiring presentation of you. Uh, my name is Saori Suzuki from the Diplomatic School of Spain, and I would like to make a question about financiation in a sustainable way. In the intervention, the importance of long-term strate strategic view of cooperation, international cooperation and in the field of, field of innovation was repeated several times. And in order to move forward the strategy, a long-term strategy forward, it will be necessary to have a sustainable way of financing, I think. On the other hand, the budget, uh, budget for international cooperation and, uh, and research and development of technology tend to, tend to have uh, much influence of the change of economic situation. As we saw in the moment of financial crisis of 2008, for example, we saw the drastic Re reduction of the budget uh, in this 
the, this kind of fields. So taking into account that situation, I would like to know your opinion about what kind of, what kind of strategy or policy, met policy should be taken in order, to, in order to secure the sustainability, sustainability of financing. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, um, I think this is, uh, I mean, you can approach this um, question from different angles. I mean, maybe the most obvious is has to do with, you know, with the problem of debt, you know, and actually, you know, there's like eight countries, you know, participating in the BRI that has been really identified as uh, countries in risk, you know, from the default because of BRI projects, you know, but most of them are small countries, you know, mm -hmm. have invested in relatively big, you know, BRI projects. And the problem of those projects is that, as we mentioned before, or uh, maybe I didn't because I didn't have the time probably to, to mention all the things I wanted, but is that one of the problems with the BRI projects sometimes is that they are focused, some of them, more on short-term business perspective than long-term, you know, um, sustainable, you know, development. Um, and this is quite obvious, for example, when it comes to coal uh, power plants, and this also related with climate risks, because uh, as you may know, uh, China is investing quite a lot in coal power, power plants, you know, and uh, those, for example, those power plants, they are expected to have uh, like a life cycle, or let's say like 30 years, in order, you know, like to return the, the investment. But as climate legislation is expected to change, you know, before that, uh, a very significant amount of those investment can become like strand assets, you know. And actually, the, there is an OCDE report, you may have read about it, that identified that at the moment, it's like a, okay, big number, like a hundred thousand million dollars on um, travel assets, you know, related with BRI investment, you know. And, and of course, if, if you don't conduct, you know, like proper uh, business plans for some of the projects, you know, that you may have this, this, this situation. And, and another point uh, is, that as Marie mentioned that before, Marie, this idea that you need to really to involve the private sector, you know, because this is not just about lending public money, you know, to these countries, this is about to make bankable projects, you know, it's, it's, it's about using private money to, to make business sector more interest, interested, you know, in engaging in, this, in these projects, you know, and I think that's a key part. If uh, we are not able to do that, the scale, you know, of these projects is going to be like actually much more limited, you know, that it would be necessary, so, you know. And uh, maybe I could just add something. Of course, you have to um, look at the project from the beginning. Is it worthwhile? <laughs> what will it mean if we can build a, a road and a power plant here? Can we recover the money? And I think here, Japan is actually very clever because they have long experience with this, how to calculate and what is going to happen. Do you want to add, do you well, want to add some questions yes, on yes, the ground? Just to please. add a little bit, mm. I mean, I will say 90% of, of the project in our case, it, it's starting with a return of the investment really, really clear and really uh, measured. I mean, that the, if there's no uh, return of the investment really defined, there's no project. I mean, more and more, it's true that it's short term, and, and if you don't have the return of investment in, in less than two years, probably there's no, there's no project uh, in terms of, of development, which, which is a problem for the long term. But I mean that the, the pressure and the tension in the, in the, in the P&L of, of the companies it, it is, is now going in that way. So in our case, in the past, the, the, the year and the projects were, well, starting with a, with a vision of technology or a vision of a new product in, in let's say, seven, ten years. Now it's really medium short term with clearly defined and measured return of the investment. There's no other way. And th there's another trend which is also really interesting, which is, uh, I think that we have commented in some of the, of the speakers, is related with the servitization. I mean, that everything related with try to, try to move from CAPEX to OPEX. 
Okay, so most of the projects that we have now, it's moving from to, to sell product to, to sell services. Okay, now everything related with the data, AI, and it, it's, it's helping that. So now we have, for example, I mean that production as a service. I mean that more and more the, the, the machinery equipment is not, it's not sold uh, as the equipment, but it's sold based on the use of the machine, based on the, on, the, on the number of parts, of the good parts that you are having at the end of the line. So everything could be measured in real time. So this is moving. It, it's quite interesting because for the, for the big companies, for the OEMs, for the tier one, more and more they are asking for really return of the investment clear. And second, I mean, uh, uh, give me a service. Not, not, not sell me a product. Uh, uh, so in, in that case, I mean that uh, it, it's moving, the decisions are moving from, from uh, CapEx analysis to, to OPEX analysis. So in that case, everything related with the financing and, and, and the, the money that you need for that investment, it, it's changing a little bit. And, and this is a trend that, well, in our case, it's, it's clearly, uh, clearly uh, embedded in all, all the projects. I don't know, I'm a Okay, so we have another question here from yeah. Anna. I was also going to ask about the financing, but maybe from a slightly different perspective, because I'm, I'm sure we have to mobilize. Um, we cannot have the development targets we have if we don't mobilize the private sector, but also still we need the public sector. Mm -hmm. you know? And we are seeing that even if EU and Japan are huge uh, development aid donors, uh, the European Union is right now discussing the next multi-annual framework, financial multi-annual framework, and they are discussing how to spend more, less, not more. And uh, Japan has been spending the same on development for the last many, ten years. They are very far from this 0 0.7 of target. They are around 0 0.2, I think, which is still very good because it's Japan, so it's a lot of money. But it's uh, they are not really looking into uh, giving more, but into giving less, at least, at least the European Union. So how do you use this window of opportunity on connectivity if you are not sure that you can mobilize the, the money that you need? Are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, it, it's not an easy question, but I think even uh, if I'm looking to my own country, Sweden, we never used to give loan aid, you know. Everything we gave was grant aid. We, that means we paid 100% of a road if we built a road or a power plant. Uh, this is not the case any longer. They even opened a loan department at SIDA, which is our equivalent of JICA, where they tried to find out where can they make an impact by, by using financing tools. So even if in that sense we look, and we look at the figures, it's not so much. But a little can go a long way if you do it in a smart way. And I think that's how we have to calculate. And also if we look at the world such as it is and where, what kind of economies we have, Europe that used to be besides the US and Japan, the big developing countries who could give aid, we are not all that dominant any longer. We're small players. So I think that is one of the reasons we also have to consider the people at home and the people in Europe, the migration which is taking place and the refugees pouring into uh, Europe. This costs a lot of money. That's maybe why we are so reluctant. And I heard about Spain cutting some years ago 71% of all ODA or something like that. It's also a matter of attitude. In Sweden, we had the other way around. We had a government, Social Democrats, and the Communists and the Greens say, we won't join you unless you assure us that you will give 1% to development cooperation. So it, it, it is a different situation. Yeah, if, but if I may, I think that we should not approach this issue just looking at um, 
official development aid, you know, because actually the, the, the approach, as mm. you mentioned before, is just to move beyond that yeah. and try to, to mobilize, you know, actually the, the EU they have um, proved this connectivity, this mm. budget for this connectivity initiative, it's like 60 billion uh, euros, you know, mm. and um, this is the idea, is mm. not to make uh, grants, yes, grants, you know, but mm. you try to, as I said before, you try to make, to use public money to make bankable projects, to make business projects, but I think, like Agustin mentioned before, if you just leave the private sector alone, because, you know, their the, uh, timing uh, view when it comes to revenues and so on is very short term. So there are so many infrastructure projects that they require a long term perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's the part which public money could help in order yeah. to try to make this more like bankable projects mm -hmm. than before, you know? So I think that that's, I mean, even if aid as such may be reduced, mm -hmm. you know, the financing resources that are going to be devoted to this are going to increase. Yeah. But because they are not going to be just aided anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's the way it has been approached. But just be clear, I'm not an expert on financing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of give you like the precise details, you know, mm -hmm. on which kind of uh, initiative are like the right incentives for business. Community, although I've been sitting in some seminars talking about this, but you know, but, but for me, some of the details, you know, I, I don't really grasp that because my of expertise. But I think that the key point is, that, is this idea. We need to move a little bit beyond uh, ODA, you know. Mm -hmm. is. And I think ODA is actually an outdated yeah. uh, definition of what yeah. development cooperation means. It's a post-war thing, and yeah. we are now moving away from that one. I, even in Japan, they do not call it an yeah. ODA charter yeah. any longer, but a development cooperation yeah. charter. Yeah. And there is a mixture of public-private yeah. in a way we didn't used to have yeah. it. Or development financing, you know, these more broader concepts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Mm. Sorry, so for instance, uh, uh, Indian's metro, that are uh, 50 percentage from the uh, JICA's loan, and 10 percentage is at uh, uh, any other's ADB or something, and 40 percentage is at uh, uh, the local loan. And uh, that, uh, we contract to the uh, approximately 40 number of the company uh, for the uh, metro's project, uh, elevator, escalator, truck, rolling stock, signal, telecommunication, that, uh, tra uh, attractions work. So 50 percentage of the local company, and 10 percentage of the Japanese company, another 40 percentage of the European company. So that we already cooperate with the European company that's so much. Because the metro's project is that so many that the number of the uh, subject is there. Not only that the construction, but also that the system, that the uh, rolling stock or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's related to the CapEx and OPEX discussion and the three overstream destination. And my question is especially for the Reiko san, that the, uh, is there any um, difficulty in your business to, uh, in terms of the technology transfer? Uh, just like for example, the requested by the Indian government or Indian company. And the next question is to uh, the, any, anybody in the European side. What is the basic uh, uh, the way of thinking of the body technology transfer from in the EU? Mm -hmm. so first. Uh, technology is transfer, it's not so difficult. Yes, so, uh, that, uh, especially Indian's engineer uh, and Indian's uh, client, Indian's company is uh, very clever. They learn that uh, very quickly, but most is uh, difficult to transfer the management, quality, safety, and also that the maintenance, that, uh, because they have uh, no, uh, no imagine, because they didn't know that uh, metro's, uh, metro's operation, that this is the first time to them, that the construction of uh, such a machine, very easy to understand. But management is that uh, cannot imagine at this moment, maybe that after that 10 years, 20 years, yes, they have to uh, consider of this man, but in this moment, they never pay attention of this one. That is very difficult to transfer 
to the, the developing companies, com countries' persons. This is uh, my impression. I, I, should, I should have been a little bit more clear that it's a, I, I was talking about the forced technology transfer. So the request from the, the developing countries to have the, uh, the transfer of the real technology, uh, the Shinkansen should be, the real train should be a very good idea. Uh, example, we have to uh, transfer the, the design of the Virat train to China. Mm -hmm. uh, China copies that. And then China ex re export the technology to the third country. So that should be a very uh, an difficult problem for uh, the, the, the region like the EU and uh, the country like Japan how to protect our intele intellectual properties and the, 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 uh, the invested uh, um, you know, cost and the, uh, the resource on uh, innovation. But, uh, this is uh, my opinion. That are, are, uh, the, for instance, yes, a con uh, consultant job is that uh, uh, we cannot stay in that, uh, this company that, uh, uh, in long future. So that are, uh, if that are, uh, that are Indian's government or Indian's, contra uh, Indian's client uh, say, yes, we don't need the consultant. This is the uh, finish of that our job. So, and also that, uh, yeah, you said, yes, are, uh, take, uh, Technical transfer, it means that they carried out that operation by themselves. So it means that all of that technology have to be shifted to that uh, uh, local. Yeah. That is our that, uh, <laughs> storage. Of course, yes, sometimes that, uh, it looks like the storing of that our technology. But if that we go to that abroad country, we have to that, uh, thinking about that, such one. That is that my, only my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you can answer. It's more a corporate thing, right? Yeah, I think that, uh, okay, I'm going to use you know, your question also as an excuse to mention something, something else, just <laughs> related, you know, because, uh, okay, first I'm going to talk a little bit about what I want to talk and let's <laughs> tackle your question because I, I'm. I'm I'm afraid I would forget what I want to say if I don't say it right now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is also this is related with like soft connectivity, hard connectivity, and the difference between like technology and uh, skills. You want to put it that way, you know? Because I, I think that for the public perspective, you know, for um, when it comes to development cooperation, uh, the EU cooperation has focused a lot on uh, upgrading like capabilities. You know, on, on the ground, and China has focused much more on hard infrastructure. You know, of course, Japan also has a lot of experience, as Marie mentioned, on, on, on hard infrastructure. But I think that the problem here for for Europe is that when you go to many developing countries and you cooperate there on on, on transferring skills and transferring, you know, know-how, uh, this is. Maybe it doesn't sound, I mean, this is not much appreciated, actually. I mean, by, by politically or by uh, the co um, public opinion, the common people. Of course, the people you work with on a company or the people you are actually getting those skills, of course, they appreciate that, you know, because they, they know what difference it makes to them and on their careers, you know, and so on. But I think that part of the, of the reason that Chinese um, Cooperation or Chinese connectivity projects, because it's not cooperation sometimes, uh, it's been very successful sometimes in, in winning hearts and minds, sometimes, not, not, but sometimes winning hearts and minds, you know, in the developing world, is because it's very easy to see, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's for everybody to see there, you know. Um, and when it comes to technology transfer, actually, I think from our perspective, this is more of the companies. I mean, like the, the, the development agencies, they don't transfer technology in, in itself, by themselves, you know? It's, it's about the companies, you know, who, who do that kind of, of work. Um, and for China, they, they have this whole package, you know, because as you know, the way they work, you know, there's this close relationship between the companies, you know, and the, and the authorities. So they can transfer the whole, the whole thing, you know, in, in a deal. And this is also very attractive, you know? And we, of course, we don't have that level 
of coordination, you know, uh, companies they work with. Of course, you know, so I think that's part of the, of the problem, but I cannot be more specific. You know? I, I, will, I will give some experiences. I don't know if it could be for extrapolation of everything, but uh, some experiences. Uh, for us, we have two different, completely different cases. One is when, the, when you are transferring something that the use is absolutely evident. When you have a technology that you can use it for something, and in that case, it's, it's a commercial discussion, okay, which is, which is the, the, the money that you, are, uh, uh, that you are able for putting, for protecting that technology. And in that case, it's, it's quite easy. In our case, with Japan, I mean, with China, I will, I will give you another perspective. But more and more, at least in our case, uh, we, are, we are finding out that I have a technology and which is supposed to have a value, but sometimes the value is depending on the use of that technology. So let, 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 let's go with the example of collaborative robotics, okay? We were discussing some of the plans of, of Airbus, saying, okay, we have that technology, it's absolutely new, uh, it should be really great for you, uh, so, and, and the transferring not only the product, but the know-how of how to use it, it's really an added value that, okay, has a value, so that technology, that technology transfer has a value. And you know what? Uh, Airbus told me, well, you have the technology, but I have the problem. And you don't know what the problem is. And to know what the problem is also has a value. <laughs> Which was quite shock, because I mean, I mean you, you have the technology, and obviously the technology has a value, but to know where to use in an efficient way, producing money, that technology, has also a value. So uh, it was a discussion completely different from the, from, the, from the past. And in the past, okay, I have that technology and well, the value of that technology is something based on the business that you are going to produce. And he told me, yeah, but you don't know the problem. And I have the problem. The problem also has a value. <laughs> to know the problem, I mean, the relevant problem, the problem that if you solve that problem, then you, you generate benefits, you generate profit. Uh, so more and more, we are not transferring technology when you don't know exactly which is the best use of that technology into the customer. And we are more and more going into the risk sharing projects. Okay, let's put together, you have some knowledge, probably the knowledge of the problem. I have some knowledge, probably the, the knowledge of the solution. So let's work together. Let's put a framework program and let's define the benefits for both of us based on the benefits that you achieve. That, which means it's a risk-sharing contract. It's, not, it's less and less a transfer of technology, but a, let's say, joint venture, uh, the research common program, uh, risk-sharing, that we are absolutely aligned. If there is benefits, both we will have money. If there's no benefits, both we will, we will, we will lose money. <laughs> so more and more is for transferring technology to risk-sharing risk projects based on technology. And, and one word about, around China. In China, I think that 12 years ago, 15 years ago, in doing the, the first projects, was absolutely, you are absolutely dead. I mean, that if they copy the, the, the technology, you are dead. You, you, you cannot fight there, okay? My feeling is that in, in our last projects, from a couple of years, three years ago, from now on, they are really, really uh, concerned about that because they are fighting between them. So if there's a Chinese company which is fighting against us, okay, you are dead. But if there are two Chinese companies fighting between them, then they want to protect against the other Chinese company, not against, against us. So more and more, they are really worried about that, that, that protection of the IP and how to protect the technology and that, okay, a patent, it's, it's really interesting. In the past, okay, if there's a patent or not, who cares? Now they are asking in the project, okay, are, are, we gonna, are we gonna launch a patent? Okay, so now you are interested in the patent. Say, yeah, because I have another Chinese guy which is trying to fight against me, so <laughs> probably the patent now is interesting also for me. So now it's changing a little bit, at least in, in, our, in our project. I just, uh, I just hope that EU and Japan have the common thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Or 
Yeah. Well, it's true that in our case, at least in our case, in our place, which is a really tiny, small part of the business in China, for sure. Uh, uh, our perspective is that now, more and more, it's not only a transfer of technology for Chinese, because the level of the technology in China is increasing so mm. high, so brilliant way. I mean, that I find out there are brilliant engineers, brilliant physicians, mm. brilliant projects, and now more and more it's not a matter of transferring technology, but building new devices, new products, new businesses together with them, because when we go with a technology, they add other added value technologies, and at the end we have a great product. But, but it's not only, a, a, only to transfer, it, it, it's to co-developing with them. More more, I mean, the, the level of the, some of the Chinese universities with, that are working with us is absolutely brilliant. And, and there was one conversation uh, some months ago there in, in Nanjing uh, that one guy was asking me, Agustin, I don't want the, I don't want the, 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 the best practices. I want the next practices. Okay, so they, they, they don't want any more the best practices from Europe. They, they, they want the next practices, and probably the next practices has to be, or could be built together. That, that's, that's my point of view, that that's an opportunity there. Can I just have a point concerning what this is all about? <laughs> the sustainable uh, connectivity and the uh, quality infrastructure, when this agreement was signed in, in Brussels, four days later, the BRI official Chinese page, they changed and became much more environmental friendly and uh, transparent and they put in all the buzzwords from the <laughs> European Japanese agreement. So uh, whether they implement or not, we don't know, but at least they follow and they listen. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I, think. I think we need to surpass our time, so I don't know if it's time for one more thing or last question, or just we finish here. If there's a really like. No? So, well, very, uh, thank you very much for our speakers and thank you very much for the audience to be here and to ask the questions. We just conclude uh, this session on innovation and connectivity between EU and Japan. Thank you very much.